Hello everybody, I welcome you on the second day of our RGB non-conference introduction everyone where we are trying to get through all the standards which are related to client-side validated states and RGB spectrum protocols over Bitcoin network and Lightning network. Uh, I would like to start today with a small recap of yesterday talks because we have discussed a number of trade-offs and possible protocol improvements and however after that discussion it happened that our evening talks and uh, homework has resulted in a, some discoveries which I'd like to recap and uh, update the yesterday information. So, uh, the new developments since yesterday. Uh, first of all, uh, I found that it is still possible to explore lex length extension attack against the hashing function to leak some private information. Uh, and this can be not specific to RGB only, it can be applied to any existing public uh, key tweaking protocol and potentially it may be used even in taproot uh, so it will be nice to analyze this possibility and see where we can improve also uh, taproot and public key tweaking procedure in general the second uh, there is a reason to allow non squared schnorr public key serialization for our protocol to committing to the regional public key i'm still talking about the public key tweaking i would like to number them and I have uh, to, we have to finalize, yesterday we didn't have enough time to go through this, but I would like to summarize and add additional details on the exter external parts of the commitments at the level of public key transaction output and transaction, and uh, provide you the algorithm, which we didn't discuss yesterday, for extracting public key from arbitrary Bitcoin script in a deterministic fashion. So these are four points I would like to discuss before we begin th with the today topics. The first one is the length extension private sleek. Uh, how it can be explored? We, uh, we already discussed that with a um, hashing function, uh, at least those we are using in Bitcoin protocol, namely uh, SHA-256. Uh, we can provide a hashing function additional data, extending the original message without knowing it. However, while it's still hard to utilize to change the commitment, because basically the commitment, uh, the final commitment and tweaking factor will be updated as well, so there is no way to attack in this regard. We can use the same vulnerability, but uh, in a different perspective. Let's assume that we have some protocol. We are not talking about RGB. It can be any protocol that operates on public key tweaking by committing to some messages. This can be plain text messages, taproot, scripts, whatever. We don't, we, are, we are just don't care at this stage. And let's assume that as an attacker, we know some message uh, commitment. Like we created this message ourselves and we know what is the hash of this message. We can even use a target hash procedure like in taproot. It doesn't change anything because we append the tag at the beginning of the message. So if you know the message and we know the semantics of the protocol, for instance, in this example, I gave a simple uh, uh, possible way of doing that. Like, let's assume that the message is the text in some language, like English language and it is composed of words. And we know the vocab vocabulary for that language. The vocabulary for English language is not really large. It's tens of thousand words, and the common words are even, if we will count on the frequency of words, our search through the vocabulary can be really efficient. So if we know the original message, which is sum, we can easily append a new words to it and if we know the hashing information, we have a vocabulary of hashing information as well, so there is protocol running in the world, and we know the different commitments under that protocol, but we don't know the original messages to which it is committed. We can simply, through the vocabulary, construct, by extending this original message, we can step by step reconstruct and find all possible applications 
all possible existing messages and getting the original message. So it's a kind of brute force attack, but it requires not a lot of computational resource. So with the hashing procedure, we unable to uh, prevent such an attack. This attack usually is mitigated by adding additional randomness to each message. So we either have to modify each of the protocols that use public key tweaking so the message has an appended data which are random or entropy data, or we use HMAC procedure where anywhere we are adding the entropy in the introducing the public key to which we are tweaking. So we wouldn't be able to have a vocabulary of all possible messages because even if we have the same message used by two different parties they will have different public keys and the tweaking factor will be different in this case so my proposal is come back to the use of hmac instead of hash because first of all it it definitely helps us to solve this problem and i'm not sure that is the Last problem we can discover how the length extension attack can be utilized to leak the privacy. There could be future attacks more sophisticated, which I just can't imagine today. Also, additionally to this problem, it will help us to do other things. First of all, we, we can't stick to a single format of public keys because we need to support legacy systems, not only Taproot. And Taproot applies some additional uh, requirements. So if we were using squared public keys, we need just to use squared public keys, meaning that not all the public keys will count. And if our tweaking procedure re results in non-squared public key, or we, have, we are running some protocol and we can't change the public key we are using, and it is, is not squared, we basically can't use this procedure. So we have to supply different formats of public key serialization. With HMAC, we get rid of this problem because HMAC doesn't require public key to be serialized. It works with the public key as a public key, as uh, not on the level of the byte string, but on the level of public key itself. It's have its internal procedure for applying this entropy from public key into the message. So with HMAC, we don't need to care about the public key serialization, which is the other reason to do that. And uh, basically by HMAC we're solving two problems, all potential attacks that are coming from the hashing function shortcomings and uh, getting rid of these problems related to exact specific format of public key serialization. So th the resulting procedure which I would like to propose for public key tweeting, quick tweaking, it's starting from the bottom. We have some arbitrary lengths, arbitrary format message, which is pro we, we don't we are agnostic to that protocol, and we're computing a target hash of this message with a some protocol specific part. It's not a part of our standards. We're just starting with a point where we have some hash number at the beginning as a message. We require this hash number to be a target hash, but uh, we don't know which protocol we are using underneath. Then we are using HMAC procedure with the original public key. After that, we do a target uh, hash with the tag specific to our protocol of public key tweaking, and the result is the tweaking factor. Yeah. Is it one tag or one tag or two? Two, two. Tag function means that it just does everything like it, it should do in the Schnorr, Bip Schnorr. So we're just using an external entity. We provide this function with the output from HMAC and with our tag, and it does everything like it does everywhere. Uh, then we check that the resulting hash is smaller than the uh, prime field order of our elliptic curve. If it is smaller, we're proceeding further. If it is uh, bigger, we just replace our original public key with the other public key and repeat procedure once again. As a result, we are getting this tweaking factor, which we multiply on the generated point, checking that we haven't got a point at infinity at this stage. If we have got point of infinity, we are again replacing original public key and start the procedure from the very beginning. Then we do a, a public key addition operation between this new uh, public key coming from the tweaking factor and our original public key. Again, we check that that we don't get the point at, at infinity. If we got, we repeating the operation. If not, we now have the tweaked public key T. Yeah. Why can't we just do the, the scan 
important that we really uh, that we uh, change the process in the office that we can now use Skype for this. And if that exists, we think it's much better to have to change the hash in the method or to change entropy in the method for keeping the same entropy. Well, changing entropy in the message requires us to operate to our protocol to fail, meaning that we need to return the failure. I would like to proceed all possible failures and make deterministic protocol which is able to commit anyway. The probability of these three events, each of them, is like 10, more than 10 in minus uh, 66 degree. So it's like once in the history. Uh, so it wouldn't happen. So this wouldn't fail anyway. But because we need deterministic code, I introduce this repetition just to just to prevent any possible undeterminism. In case of uh, t the taproot proposal, it covers this problem as well, and it says that the protocol just fails. The taproot protocol, if it encounters this issue, it just fails. You can't create um, a taproot output if you got it on this mission and it just returns zero the same way it does in the elliptic curve basic library. I don't know which is better. I do prefer the de deterministic procedure, maybe because I'm right now more Rust way than Seal way. You want, yeah. Well, we can't attack at that level. But what we are doing, we are not preventing somebody appending information to the message, but we're preventing, uh, uh, let's take the RGBS example or taproot, uh, better RGB, because we have, as an owner of some state, we have a history of state transitions and each of them are committed state transitions. And if we don't include the randomness from the public key, we can basically uh, reconstruct the vocabulary of those past messages, because we know both the source message and uh, the uh, hash function result. And we can apply it to analyze other commitments for which we don't know the source message. So basically, we leak privacy. We are not doing the length ex extension attack, but we using this vulnerability to increase our ability to analyze the information that we don't know. Yeah, but under the protocol, uh, we don't know what information can leak, like in the RGB protocol, is the tweaking factors, not uh, the messages. So we can now, if we'd like to disassemble the original message to understand, we don't know message, we know the tweaking factor, and go from tweaking factor to message, we can't do that through HMAC on that level already. So we don't have like the result of this in public space, but we may have a tweaking factors leaking into the public space. Without, we, we can. No, we, 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 we can, because we know the semantics of the protocol, we can use length extension attack to analyze other messages until we find something. So we, we are not reversing the hash function. Yes. 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 
Th that's that's the point that you can extend it. That's the length extension attack. But only only when only when that is finished. I have not yet hashed. No, after after that's the point. After the message is being hashed, you can extend the hash. Okay, so what wha what is your proposal? You mean at all or here in this specific? In, in, in the position it is at the moment. But okay, so wha what is your proposal? You mean? Just a second. You mean that it is better to do like this? Right? Yeah. Or or moving moving that all below. Yeah, well, it's essentially that, and then the line would move up, right? This specification procedure would only start where LMBP is hashed. LMBP one. Okay. So, any other plus possible issues? Because once you do it, once you H max, then the message can't be length extended. Yeah. And then afterwards. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I think that would be better. Can we improve in any other point? So we can, you, the, the only, even the, the other reason without this vulnerability of privacy leaking. HMAC solves the problem with the public key serialization. So it doesn't require us to introduce another protocol la layer. The only issue here then is that because the HMAC involves the public key, then you're providing the, you're providing the next module with plain text. As in that you provide the message in plain text. So I don't know if that's, I mean that might be an issue. Not well, it can be internal software leak. Yeah. yeah. Meaning like, but we will do some kind of w standard implementation with a peer review, so I don't think that it should be an issue if they are using the proper library. Yeah. If they are not using, again, they share the same memory scope. It's not an external process, so if there is some vulnerable code or backdoor, it can anyway read the par message by scanning the memory. Plain text. Yeah. What about the protocols which you described? Um, are these like HTML tags? There's like, um, I mean, if, if the code is a different format of the message, how are you implementing? But are they classified by IPB or something? Like no, no. We are we are saying that this LNPBP protocol takes the message, and we advise to commit to the semantics of this message. Yeah, no, we, uh, well, you providing us. We are agnostic to the semantics of the message. Hmm. Because otherwise, if I can basically 
specify the format in the source, I'm flexible to draw the line later wherever I want to, and then I can basically say, oh, everything in the beginning was just the wrong character, so this union and only the last byte of the new message. Um, and in this way, I can again have two different messages being presented. So it will be fixed length prefix. Do you have fixed length, or do you have something like the source key for how long the prefix is? Like type length variable. We, we even don't need two because it was to avoid the collisions and here we can't have a collision so something like this oh you don't see it just a second <laughs> so now we know that it's always 32 bytes Yeah, because it's tagged hash procedure. It hashes the tag, adds two hashes up front, and then uh, appends the message, and then hashes that over. Yeah, I was originally doing that, but uh, here we don't need it because there we have a taproot tag hash procedure because it can collide with other protocols in Bitcoin. At this level, we can't collide with other protocols at all. We just need fixed length prefix. But, but why anyway? Because uh, we deviate anywhere, anyway, the, the tagged hash, it uh, will operate on fixed lengths, and here we have not fixed lengths method. It, it, it again, this part under the dashed line, it's not the part of the specification. We are saying that we do recommend to commit to the uh, message semantics, and one of the possible ways is to use a fixed length prefix, let's say like that. Maybe we wouldn't even say that you have to hash the protocol specific, but it should be well-defined fixed length prefix, always present. So the, the the proposal then becomes like this. Just a second. Well, two ways of tagging is not uh, is not strange because Taproot uses like five ways of tagging or something like that. So it tags at the each level of Merkle tree and does that through all the protocol. So this is quite simple <laughs> tagging comparing to what we have in Taproot. So uh, this protocol then, as an input, receives three things. First, original public key. The second is uh, the message, which can be arbitrary length message, like a byte string. And the third is protocol specific tag. Then it runs this. I, I, I don't see, from one point, I don't like these two tags with the HMAC, because again, the tag it has, here, the difference with the previous version is that here we hash, and again, HMAC, HMAC receives the fixed length message while by applying the prefix of the fixed lengths, we are not hashing the result. So it can't be a tagged hash. It, it should be a message prefixed with a hash. I will put it back.
back like are you not sure that this change so we will make it a part of the protocol oh all right So once again to go through the rationale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the the protocol input still original public key protocol specific type tag of arbitrary length and message, and probably the fourth input is the pub key derivation strategy or the the actually used pub key will be just an output. Uh, now we can't return just a pub key. We need a derivation strategy because we need to, to be able to create private key afterwards. So four inputs: derivation strategy, public key, regional public key, message arbitrary length, and protocol specific tag arbitrary length. Am I right? No. We don't know. It depends on the protocol and message. Okay. We would like to be agnostic to that. Yeah. So, but we we the, we here we introduce this uh, public key derivation strategy. So maybe that is why Taproot is just failing because he would like to delegate it upwards. So it's up to the like. If this is used inside the wallet, it is wallet who should decide on the public key derivation strategy. There is no way how we can, you know, our uh, know upfront all the possible public key derivation strategies. So it's just not. It's better not to introduce it here. So instead of failing, in, instead of replacing public key, we will fail the protocol. Probably right. Otherwise, we need another fourth input, and it will be of very complex structure. <coughs> Sometimes I'm surprised how much time actually uh, is spent on designing this specific protocol for public key tweaking, but I do understand that this protocol is the core at uh, the core of security of client-side validation and. The eighty percent of prevention of double uh, spent attacks and leaks are happening at this level. So I will just fail the procedure, fail the protocol. Sorry, I, I will put this changes before we forgot them. So here we are failing. And here. This acquisition of successful operation. I don't need this. I don't need this. I just need this. And we fail if we have a point at, infin at infinity. So oh. are we happy now? Okay. 
Okay. So the NADP is from here and it's com not compatible from there, right? Yes. L not compatible, but at the same level of security assumptions. So this tagged hash allows us uh, to commit to what it is. It is a public key tweaking procedure under this specification, under this standard. We can't. Well, it is necessary because if we will apply that, for instance, to taproot procedure, uh, to intermediate public uh, intermediate key, we already a part of the taproot protocol stack, and we need to use something compatible. Also, even outside of the taproot, there are other protocols doing public key tweaking other than we, and our message can be reinterpreted as a byte string under some other protocol and it might be valid or there could be an atta attack that can make this this possible while if we're using the well-known target hash under our protocol well it's not even this against the other protocol but there is another protocol existing and this protocol message can be reinterpreted without tag under our protocol or something like that so it's better to commit to the protocol with the tag. I'm not convinced that that doesn't mean anything. I mean, because I mean, you have a clear flow of information, and if you take a protocol from, like an input from some other protocol, in, in your flow of information, it would just not have any proper semantics. Nobody will be able to provide you with any metrics. Mm. Because you already have the protocol specific tag in the beginning, which is very. Hmm. So you, you mean that this step could be unnecessary? Yeah, it feels a little bit like that. I mean, on the other side, yeah, why not include it? But we can do another thing. thing. Again, <sighs> just I need to change it. Mm. Mm, we can construct. We can still use both tags. Yeah, that, that would not sound good. But without this part. So the message is the original message prepended with uh, two hashes. So let's name it H2. And I think I didn't have it wrong here. I mean, you can just have the NADP tag plus the protocol specific tag and it has to be one. No, no. They can still have something a little bit more crazy. Uh, we still would like to pre have a double uh, prefix for taproot compatibility. So basically, basically for this part is the message, but the message prepended with a protocol specific part. And here we add a few different times that we also can. Or you don't think that it's plausible? I can just one hash with NADP1 and protocol specific tag with NADP2 together. Together, you mean like this? No, the NADP1 and the protocol specific tag, if you combine these two. Via hash function or directly? Yes. So if you just concatenate them? But the. Like in a static header. Like basically, a header that has two 
You mean can, yeah. like this, yeah. without hashing? Yeah, now you put into a hash and put that in this way. Like this. Okay. But it should be uh, strong and it can show you the picture of the blockchain. Yeah. Yeah. But why do you think it is better? But if you open two hash bars in Netflix, you don't know which one you can see what is happening. Yeah. Yeah, you can identify the protocols by the hash. Yeah. So, so maybe it's better to do this way. Let me shift it a bit. Something like this. Well, yeah, probably because other protocols is about the other stuff. They can be used like here, for instance. But it can't be because now I can only see the first thing to write in any other source for those things. Whereas in the other case, I just have. And you can just rainbow table. Yeah. There is not a lot of protocols that will be operating, so it wouldn't have the security and privacy. Yeah. If you don't want to open Twitter, no. <laughs> no. Well, we can add it at some other levels, but. Not that this commit just just it's just a public key tweaking procedure, which we also would recommend outside of RGB or anywhere when you need to. It's just collision resistant privacy protecting yeah. commitment procedure with the public keys. That's all. Yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe you shouldn't ever complicate it. It's already looks a bit complicated. But it lo looks less compli complicated than original, right? Yeah. All right. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> we we are not using HMAC on taproot level. Uh, taproot is not using HMAC at all. Yeah. Yeah. Here. So this is intermediate public key for taproot. So this would be original intermediate public key, the, 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 that one. If I, if I switch to the taproot graph, so we basically, we go here, the red circle. So we take this as original public key, tweak it, and put it back into the protocol. Yeah. But we, 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 there is no double hashing. The message is a variable length message. It's not a hash. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, but we have a problem with the public key uh, serialization then. Yeah. But we need to commit then to the serialization algorithm of the public key before hashing. So it, it just adds complexity. Because we can serialize it differently. At least three formats as of today. And we don't know how many we will be in the future. It would because it's it's a different commitment. Then we need to introduce how to specify that into the protocol. So each Mac is just simpler. It's just it's, it it doesn't add a lot of computational complexity actually. What I'm interested in is this tweaking procedure can be applied. At, at this level, would it be better for taproot or not? I, I, I don't understand what, what, what part are you talking about? Yeah, it's not about taproot tree at all. No, I know, but like that's because when the spending conditions define how the app is being implemented. I'm not getting it. Uh, in terms of like depending on which spending part you use. Which part of this graphic are you talking? Can can you can you just <laughs> so No, I, I don't think that's a good idea because anyway, in the Bitcoin script, even if we have branch, we attach ownership not to the branch. It's like with the Bitcoin script itself, the ownership under that transaction output. And you need to fulfill any of the branches or the, the conditions. So the same is here. And what? Yeah, but we the, the only one will win, and it will take all. We can't split the ownership, so it's no no reason to do that. Like in in Lightning Network, you still have different branches for satisfying the conditions of the transaction output. But whoever satisfies this condition first just takes the whole value. So. I I just don't get a use case even. Again, the, the ownership is bound to the transaction output. However, we shouldn't differentiate from Bitcoin. Owns. Whoever owns Bitcoin owns the state. And Bitcoins in the transaction output are not split across any branches of Taproot or Bitcoin script or anything. It's atom uh, atomic to the transaction output. So I, I just don't think that we need to go in that, in that direction. Because we will break the whole security model, and I'm not sure that we will win anything. So then, if we if we have this multi-tree scenario, say like there's nine keys in the taproot, there's some random keys in the random tree, right? Yeah. One of those, and if if it's just one of us that wants to kind of integrate it to steal the app taproot, then anyone could kind of steal, or anyone could start that pool. So we need. I, I, I don't see any problem here. So there are nine people creating an uh, internal pub, pub key, public key, internal public key. They, they add tweaking factor to that public key after that. And then they create a top root over it, right? 
it means basically that uh, to spend this output they need to satisfy the condition either of this part or of this multi-seq and after that added again the tweaking factor that's all so what it, that's fine My question was, so we now have these for our commitments in the RGB, but should we also, because many of us are participating in the top review, top root review, this tweaking procedure, this tweaking procedure may run also under this protocol. Here, the here. Uh, there is a target hash. Should it be better H Mac or not? I don't know. Well, uh, the 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 on the different scheme, but it's everywhere different. So here we have here we have uh, a digest as a message and the original key. We create a target hash with a top root tagging or not. It, it did have, but I think that it is target hash function because it's used everywhere. So instead of doing HMAC here, we are using target hash function. That's how we did it. And because these scripts can be quite typical ones, and it's a limited vocabulary of scripts. Wouldn't it be better to do the HMAC here? Yeah. Yeah, but it has to be the original. This one. No, 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 no. no. Not so. You have to look at the script. I mean, the vocabulary. Yes. Ah, the data yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. A lot of emphasis. And from efficiency to scale, it is better to do hash than each map here. So and of course it could be the worst we do and it could have two people. I mean I suppose we could have uh, top secret every week in this course, but there's an option of that that's fine. Or or it's two map secret. We don't actually need like multi secret or anything. But now we don't want to have a two secret as well. It could be you know we can have a two that matches and then well, even again with the public key, people will reuse public key anyways, and uh, it, it can. It's it's more ha it's harder here because there we have just a single public key in script. We have number of public key potentially. However, like if the top root will be used at Lightning and it will be one day, meaning there will be a standard outputs frequently used that contain only two pub two public keys over and over again, even inside the channel updates. And the leaking of the information, well, <laughs> because the difference between a uh, hash of the public key uh, plus the message from the HMAC is that HMAC adds entropy of public key into the whole message. While with HMAC, you c it basically lengths extend the public key with the message content. So it's easier to, to do a vocabulary attack, significantly easier. Okay, I, I will probably at least propose to this, this point for taproot and we'll see what would be the feedback. But here I, I do think that we really strongly need to use HMAC because for Taproot there is no public key serialization problem. 
also. We have this problem. And we don't have that uh, computational efficiency requirements like Top would have. So here, I don't see any reason why we should avoid using HMAC instead of uh, hash function. OK, I, I propose to finish this part and to move forward. The next thing from yesterday, I have created this slide to uh, summarize the actual commitment procedures. So for each commitment, I just remind you, these are all embedded commitment, meaning there is some container. We commit to the message. We put the commitment to the message into this container, and we get this actual commitment. To verify the commitment, we need to have the same original container and then to repeat the commitment procedure and make sure that our commitment which we received is the same as we compute over by repeating the whole commitment procedure. So it's very easy, simple verification algorithm. But for run, to run this for a transaction, we need additional data which can't be found in the transaction itself. And here I listed this additional data uh, for each of the commitment types. So for the transaction, uh, we need to know, because we introduced the tr uh, entropy, we use, you, you remember, we used the fee plus some external entropy to compute and point to the transaction output which really has the commitment. So because we know the transaction fee from the transaction itself, we also will need to know this external uh, entropy and we need to provide it to the procedure. The second, we will need script, pu uh, script pubkey specific data, which are depending on the script pubkey type. And there are uh, at least four of the possible options. We uh, may use, we may need original public key for op return, op to, uh, pay to public key, and pay to witness public key hash or public key hash. We may use the original script with the original public keys untweaked for the script hash variants. And we need the uh, original intermediate public key plus script Merkle root for top script. So they are depending on the type of the output we are using. And for sure, for any public key tweaking, we need just the original public key. Yeah. Sorry, I don't got get it. If in the case you use copy without defining script. Here it is. Yes, but if you, if you do not define any script in the Merkle tree, which is only the script within the top two stack. Yeah. The stack, yeah. Then you treat the internal key with the hash of the stack. Yes, so. This is the hash for this internal key. Yes. Yeah. Do you need to specify which one? No, because otherwise. Uh, with this, we will be able to differentiate what output type it, it is. We just, if we help our out, we can add this code. So there are basically two subroot cases. Oh. Which I don't think this is specified in the protocol, but it is, it is recommended to do this because then you can prove that there is no Merkle root stemming from this Merkle tree. Or is that what you're about to say? Well, it can easily, so if we can have the condition that if the script Merkle root equals to the hash of the intermediate key, it basically means. So if you were doing step of eight, no way to prove that a key was not tweaked. The only way to prove this is to tweak the key in a way that there is no stem from the key. By, by tweaking with the hash of the public key, you can prove that there was no. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it, it, it doesn't. So we can make this part optional. So if it is there, we know that it is uh, a script underneath. If it's not there, we just hash the original intermediate public key and tweak with it under the top root procedure. So we can provide less data. And I will 
say this is like this. So, in three cases, we need just a regional public key. In one case, with a custom script, we will need probably a number of public key, one or more, depending on how many public keys are used. With the script hash, we need the whole original script plus the public keys. And with the taproot, we need original intermediate public key plus optionally script Merkle root for the cases when we use script. Right? Okay, and on the transaction le level, additionally to this, we need a uh, protocol specific knowledge of protocol specific entropy. So that's how we commit into the transaction. And this, uh, regarding this protocol specific entropy, will we go back to the demonstration mode? Uh, with this protocol specific entropy, there is one very important point we were discussing yesterday uh, with Martina. Yeah, and um, the point is that uh, if it wouldn't be a protocol specific entropy and s some other form of entropy, uh, not the same for all the protocols, it may allow us to do a double spending attack. Uh, it's hard, the case is hard to explain, uh, so I, I was trying to draw it, but it's not simple to draw. But the b bottom line idea is that uh, if I have two inputs spending some single-use seal output, so closing these two seals, uh, they will provide different, under the same protocol, and they will provide different entropy, I can disclose to one party only one source and to other the two sources and they will receive different transaction output number and so I can double commit under this procedure. So both all the possible single-use seals operating under the same protocol should use the same entropy. So it, it should be protocol specific. Otherwise we can double spend. And the last point, oh no, there were two two last points from yesterday. Uh, the public key fingerprints in the log script. The next slide will be about what is log script and how it is related to other script types. So uh, in s the log script is basically plain Bitcoin script, wi which is not proceed by script interpreter to validate the transaction, but which is the part of this final validation. This is uh, the script that sh has the ha either well, that has the public key in a plain form. And these are three types of the fingerprints. The first type is that if we have a single public key hash, so we analyze script on all occurrences of this string. There could be a multiple occurrences if we have different branches, but each time we have check, seek, verify, it will be preceded by the pu pu public key. Uh, the other possible occurrence, because it, it will be the case for mostly for the pay to public key hash uh, script pop key, but for most of the scripts we will have the other option when we do provide a public key serialized under three different proper serialization model. The new top root or Schnorr serialization, the compressed format and uncompressed format. So that could be uh, a different op push plus some data lengths, but there will be always op equal and check seek with optional verify part. Because uh, tab script uh, deprecated multi seek. There is no multi seek under tab script. And nor serialization is all only possible in the top script. Yeah. The question is. Do we cover all the uh, cases? Because technically, we can construct multi-seek with a 
pubkey hashes. So this can be quite variable thing, the last line. So it could be like another op hash codes in front of each public keys. And I was thinking about doing it a check seek, or for instance, it could be just op equal. However, later I decided that only those public key which can be signed with a private key has to be part of the uh, commitment procedure. So you can't tweak the public key to which you can't provide a private key. And the only way of fulfilling that is to check in the signature. So we only use those public key that are verified for the signatures. But there is another problem because, again, nothing prevents us to introduce new opcodes between the pushing into the stack. So if we don't modify the stack, we can easily introduce new opcodes between parts of the script, like after the push procedure for the public key. So the problem we are trying to solve, we have a Bitcoin script. We need a deterministic way to find all commitment points, all public keys that has to be tweaked. First to tweak them and then later to verify that all of them are tweaked. And Bitcoin scripts can be quite different ones. I mean, you can put the same functionality in very different ways. How to deterministically specify that part? It was very a strong argument against uh, allowing any possible transaction output to uh, be used as a commitment. So the original version of uh, RGB has suggested the, that we can commit only in pay to witness public key hash or just a public key hash. However, it happens that we will be incompatible with the Lightning Protocol because basically in HTLC success and uh, HTLC failure transactions, we don't have pay to witness public key hash outputs. We have just a single witness to public uh, pay to witness script hash. And with the um, commitment transaction, soon we wouldn't have also pay to, to remote output as a pay to witness public key hash. So if we need a compatibility with a lightning, we have to commit into the pay to witness script hash. And if you need to commit to that, we need to support arbitrary Bitcoin script. When the Schnorr is really coming to Lightning, after it will come to Bitcoin. And then a year or two to adapt, to, to change the whole software stack in the Lightning protocol and all the protocols. No, no, we are not depending. We are ready for them and we wouldn't change anything when they will be out there. But we are not depending on them. So can, can we suggest, the question is, can we suggest the fingerprints that will satisfy all possible scripts, script conditions? That, that is the question. How we can deterministically dis define the public key inside the Bitcoin script. We can introduce that there could be any arbitrary uh, opcodes not modifying the stack. So we can list the opcodes which don't modify the stack content, right? Then we can say that in these particular positions, like here, or, ah, uh, in some specific positions when th where there are other public uh, opcodes may be present that do not modify the stack, uh, there could be arbitrary number of these opcodes. And then seems like we are covered. What are these positions? Well, Here. 
Maybe this is my question of like why are we trying to I mean you need the public figure written in a script for the speaker, right? Yeah. Well we that's those fees are written in a public script for the speaker, but we need to know uh that we speak all public fees in this case. So we need to know where these public fees are. Because if somebody will count them one way and the other party will count them the, the other way, you can use the double, if this was called a river, it's a double counting. And then the same thing that can happen. So we need a deterministic way, independent from the script, to count them used by the all parties. But you have only a certain amount of scripts in place, right? You don't know other players' scripts. No, but I can create other players' scripts, then. If it's valid scripts, I can create an output and spend this output, nobody will prevent me from doing that. Yeah, but then it's just not compatible with RGB or... Just explain that it is not compatible and this is transactional proof of sale. You can do that. So basically we, we, we want to introduce this complexity of saying that if you'd like to be compatible with RGB, you should use one of these nodes or you must. You must. Then why not to require to create the output under a new script, which is deterministic by the way. So provide a mini script pattern. That is the best way. Because again, what we need is not to cover all previously existing scripts because none of them were committed under the RGB. What we need is to have all the software working and counting them in the same script, well formally defined way. And the mini script is the best way of formal definition for the script interface. Okay. So, <coughs> another standard to rewrite. <sighs> so you actually say that we must use uh, the standard graphic uh, We can do that. Well, uh, I, I, I have a good memory, so I will memorize that at least till the evening, all these decisions. Uh, but, yeah. What's the appropriate uh, price action plan scenario? Okay. I feel like I'm very correct, so <laughs> but in the way I'm writing. Uh, the second is uh, Yeah, you don't remember the second. I said I, I can go through <laughs> the slides and I will remember them. Uh, no, I, I'm thinking how to structure that.
S sorry, Max. Your your suggestion about making the pub uh, script Merkle root optional wouldn't work because uh, the point here is that we trick this interval here and if we use the hash of the key the question is would we use the hash of the fixed public key here or the original one the hash of the key and the reason why we need this is if, if we don't have the hash of the key internal key in the script key or in the key the, the, the tuple will fail it's no, not, not that the tuple will fail but that we cannot prove that there are other strings in this without it, it at least uh, disclosing the information that we will send client side validation state and the state message as well no 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 because like we, we speak to internal key but that doesn't really matter you know if you we use your proposal we can do that without that so okay so we are uh no more tweaking questions. internal public keys even if we provide the client side validation information yeah. and we still cannot prove that there exists a merkle root that no we can You know, I used to original public key and I was saying that this is the hash of the original. But there is no point in doing that. It's actually not relevant. So we hash that if such is internal key. The point is that this internal key, I expect that this whole taproot will run it to the code. Meaning if we have a new key here, it will be like screen life procedure and we can't prove the key if we just read it. You see my point? Yeah, because you're right, because the internal key is keyed, so we can prove that it is keyed. But it's not keyed by the Merkle root, it's keyed with the uh, script key. So we don't have that. We can't prove that there exists a key. And the key just gets hashed with all the... It seems we are thinking about different things. So I do agree that if we can prove this internal key, and we don't have a script, the top root should be provided with the hash of the fixed pub internal key. That's fine. The point, the other point is that the, the whole design of how we treat the top root is fine, but we are not sure that it will work in the real world because usually if we don't have this part, it will be a new key. And then the wallet and everything will just do that with plain white code. So it would be nice to propose to the top root to have a hook into this procedure, which may allow public key tweaking. Not under RGB, any protocol, but basically top root would make impossible take to account of this hooking. No, I mean that the internal key should be hooked. Yeah, so top root should know that this key may be hooked under different protocols. I'm not saying that it is prevented, but it's not the protocol. The tablet not doesn't know about the client everything. Maybe it's part of the tablet. That's why. Mm. Yeah. I mean, we can't prove any public key without specifying here. But the internal. So we we treat any of these public key and because they are just all the same color, it's just a simple public key addition, right? So if we treat one of them, we treat all of them. Well, if we treat everything key, the box key is not key, but the but intermediate key is key. Yeah, inter intermediate, so basically it's like blue. We don't give the Merkle part of the top root. So we have public keys for Alice, Bob, and Harris. And they result in intermediate public keys. 
Now we would like to see briefly the public key plus some factors, but it is the same like we did, only added the public key to use the same factor and added two other So we don't think we have to keep that because it's not a public key. But it means that actually Alice can, for instance, in this case, commit to some state. And the rest of the commitment to state is not a public key. So and so that's the that's the exception where you if the command is a public key, the commit is doing it, but it does not Uh, yeah, migrate to the final action point, migrate with LMPDP2 on any script. Okay. So we, we are now coming to the end of the day first recap. So which script do we analyze? The final question. Uh, the idea is that uh, we have the source script from which we can create all the required script types under any kind of output. So there is a script from which we can generate a pub, uh, pub key script and a six script when we need to spend this pub key, a pub key script, redeem script, and six script if we have uh, a pay to witness a script hash, a pub key plus witness script and six script if we are using witness structure, or a tab script and six script if we are using zip script. So this log script, what is log script? The log script is a script from which we can generate as scripts for any type of inputs, uh, outputs, and inputs spending their outputs. So it, it should have all the necessary data, meaning that we can count all the public keys inside of it. Because basically, 
to, to generate six scripts, we need to know where are the public keys and which signatures we need to create. Right? Yeah, that's all. So now, uh, should we have a small, <laughs> small uh, break before we start the second date? Yeah, okay, let's like five, ten minutes. Okay, so let's start the main topic of the day two. Uh, first, I would like to start with the less technical part, uh, which is uh, recap their use cases for RGB and what is RGB. We already discussed what is client validated state yesterday. Now I would like to move to more generic understanding what is RGB from the user perspective. I it will be a small first section, then uh, we will move to single use seals details. Uh, required to understand the state, review of the state-related protocols and zero knowledge, which are very tightly interrelated. Uh, so starting with RGB recap, uh, what is RGB? The RGB is in fact, uh, as we discussed yesterday, is a set of standards and the implementation of these standards, I mean the code implementing those standards. Uh, and this code and the standards are about client-validated state management. Uh, the RGB is able to operate on top of Bitcoin and Lightning Network and RGB to CVS is the same as Lightning Network to state channels or a specific, uh, it is a specific set of protocols suited to work jointly. What you can do with the RGB? The first case we started with was a financial assets. We avoid to name them tokens because the whole idea of token is a little bit... Um, scummy. Uh, so uh, financial assets, uh, they could be IOU promises or stable coins or corporate shares, bonds, futures, anything that you have on paper but in the digital form on top of Bitcoin. Why do we need to bring it into Bitcoin? Why not to run this, in this uh, just a database with accounting like Nasdaq does? Well, the point is to the privacy first and the uh, censorship resistance second. Censorship resistance, so you can have a free secondary market where the issuer can't influence how do you trade your shares. Once it issued, he doesn't know who are the ownerships, who are the owners, or what trades are happening, that the trades are happening there. So there is a lot of cases for such situations. Oh, secondary, additionally to financial assets, you can use it to issue different digital collectibles, which uh, would live even when the issuer is not there anymore. Additionally to that, you can mo do a more complex schemes like uh, using RGB for different voting rights or for digital identity and reputational system. You can build a de decentralized digital identity or a forms of web of trusts or uh, reputation systems just with a plain RGB. And uh, with a web of trust, you basically will issue uh, the signatures on other people identities and it, it can be also governed by clients' validated state protocols. Uh, you can have better non-financial accounting types of systems. I'm not sure in this part yet, but I know that at least uh, Fabri, he's here, he has a very interesting idea for uh, having the, uh, the use of Lightning Network to build the accounting for electricity supply and demand when you have a lot of electricity producers. So I will probably briefly give him a word so he can describe what 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 other possible application is there? Can you please give him a microphone? It's working. Thank you so much, uh, Maxim, for the introduction. Yes, the 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 idea, at the base of uh, of this model that I've described uh, in a, in a paper I, I will share to you, is that basically you use RGB and Lightning to like mimic a sort of electricity market between uh, small producer but even bigger and consumers uh, that uh, is based uh, like uh, on, a, on a set of promises uh, on future delivery of electricity. And uh, with Maxim together we are trying to figure it out how our RGB protocol could, could settle 
these promises of a future in electricity delivery. And uh, yes, basically, this is at the end. Uh, the use of lightning is that uh, all the transaction of energy that also happens on the grid when there is the physical delivery are settled with uh, payments in bitcoins. So <laughs> we could go deeper, but uh, this is just a, a short introduction. <laughs> Uh, yeah, as far as I understand, the idea is that when you have a lot of small electricity producers in the network, like today with all the solar power, uh, a lot of households are becoming not just and consumers of the electricity, but also producing electricity, producing at night, consuming day and other schemes. You have to account all of that. And with a centralized accounting, first of all, it's not scalable for such a decentralized system. So the system, bottom line, physical system of electricity became decentralized. And we need decentralized accounting. And sometimes we don't need in instant payments just not to replenish the liquidity of the channels, for instance. We can do accounting and settle later. And for that reason, we can use different forms of tokenized things on top of RGB protocol. And... Uh, also, you can tokenize different goods, including ownership rights and access rights, and operate on these tokenized access and ownership rights with RGB. And even there is some preliminary research into can the RGB be used as a form of future contracts, meaning that, for instance, we have this storm, idea of storm with a um, uh, incentivized messaging and storage on top of Bitcoin protocol and the Bitcoin smart contract, the actual partially signed transaction can be put into the RGB and traded. And w I wouldn't say that it is like ready to go uh, idea. We still are doing a lot of research and a number of issues are not covered, but potentially we can even trade such forms of smart contracts over the client validated state. Uh, especially with a spectrum when you can do that in decentralized way with the Lightning Network. Uh, the RGB use cases is thus uh, free and decentralized secondary markets. It, it, is an, it would be an interoperable industry-wide standard. Fortunately, we will be able to make it operational not only on Bitcoin and Lightning Network, but also on Liquid. And... Uh, the core feature of RGB anyway, comparing to all existing tokenizing alternatives starting from ERC20 and any other other blockchains or Omni on Bitcoin, is it is very privacy focused and it has a zero blockchain footprint. So we do prevent use of chain analysis tools and we, as we have seen, very focused on leaking as much, as, as little information as possible. Uh, we uh, preserve privacy against the counterparties of the trading activities and state transfers. We will discuss this through, uh, throughout today. We hiding the private information from asset issuers so they can even don't know who are the current owners or the volume of the trade on the asset. And we also increase the privacy of the Lightning Network itself. I would be talking about this more uh, tomorrow. So of course there is a lot of this other projects trying to do uh, the assets on top of uh, Bitcoin. The most advanced, uh, of course, is confidential assets. Uh, we are looking not to compete with them, but more like to find a way to synergetically develop more uh, private, even more private standard, and also standard using less on-chain space, which is able to operate not only under such speci some specific uh, conditions like in liquid but also in Bitcoin and Lightning Network. So we are trying to fix comparing to all of these standards privacy, potential minor censorship, meaning that miners should know nothing that anything even happens inside some transaction and they can't distort, uh, they can't censor transactions basing if there is some trade other than Bitcoin inside this transaction or not because it can be done with a uh, with Omni protocol, for instance, they can guess that this is a special transaction having some additional price attached. So we uh, would like to avoid minor uh, incentives uh, distortion as much as possible, and we can do that with RGB. 
we reducing blockchain pollution because with public key tweaking and the way we tweak into uh, we commit into the transactions we just don't increase the size of anything uh, enable lightning network which is not yet enabled for any of these standards and convert the idea of utility token brought uh, infamously by Ethereum to the market into more ad advanced form of digital assets as we just described. The main properties are GB thus is uh, layer one sucks, uh, I don't know how to pronounce this word, wor word. Uh, basically we, we consume as best blockchain space as possible, meaning uh, we don't pollute it. Uh, privacy and a proper economics without distorting anything that exists today either in Bitcoin or Lightning Network world. So now we will need to, we will proceed to the second part because it was fast, uh, where I will be talking about more about single use seals and in relation to client validated state. Uh, I will start with the terms and definitions and I would like to explain the core idea of the state and the state transitions. In Bitcoin network and Lightning, we have a transactions. So to dif differentiate somehow for the client validated state, we, na we name any change of the state, meaning the change of the asset balances or other forms of digital tokens as a transition. So transac transition versus transaction for on-chain process. Transition is a, a state chain. So for the client validated state there are a genesis state which can be compatible to genesis block in terms of blockchain or funding transaction for state channels for client validated state it, we name it genesis state so it is the first state from which the whole history starts uh, a known state is the state allocated to a, uh, some of the transaction outputs in Bitcoin uh, blockchain or in uh, Lightning Network channel. Uh, we discussed that a lot uh, throughout yesterday. A state transition is an equivalent of transaction. We change some state and there are a, a state transition commitment proof. It is a set of client validated data accompanied by a proper transaction either from Bitcoin blockchain or from a local Lightning channel provide proving the security of the state transition the they prove and demonstrate the fact of the transition and they prove the absence of double commitment to some other state transition under the same transaction uh, and you other things which we haven't discussed yet are the client validated uh, state schema and the client validated state graph what are these uh, the schema is uh, the type of the state data, metadata, and other parameters, like possible scripts, and also a rules uh, which are used to validate some particular state. So the schema defines the state, its properties, and the rules how to validate the state. Because the state can be committed to the Bitcoin blockchain, it will, could be a valid commitment, but the state itself should be invalid because of internal inconsistency. So the schema defines how to find out if the state is internally consistent or not. And the graph is basically is a graph of all state transitions from the genesis state to some own state. And, uh, uh, meaning it's kind of the same graph with the transactions. If you own some Bitcoins, you have a graph of all transactions for your Bitcoins from the Genesis block. But it is on-chain graph. Here we have the off-chain graph of state transitions. Coming back, back to the single-use seals and trying to merge the single-use seal concept with the client-validated state concept, how they come together. So. Let's assume we have state data defined under some scheme. We commit to them using some hash function. We got the digest. And we then commit to the digest of this state data with some transaction. This transaction is a witness in terms of single use seals. And this transaction should spend some transaction output at which we will have some other previous state. And the call this process will result in commitment proofs and result in the witness transaction being published into Bitcoin blockchain or becoming a valid uh, transaction inside the Lightning channel. And this is a step, this is actually a, a transition, a state transition process. 
the previous state here is not shown, it is bound to the seal, and we change that state with this new state from the state data committed to the transaction that is spending that seal, closing the seal over the new state. So this is how the single use seals are related to the uh, client validated state. Uh, if we need to verify the fact, so here we do the state transition. On this slide, I show how we verify the state transition. Basically, we are provided with the commitment proofs, we are provided with the original seal, and we provide it with the witness transaction. And we verify that the witness transaction contains the commitment to the digest, and because the transaction itself doesn't have sufficient information like with the original scripts, original public keys, and external protocol entropy, we use these commitment proofs, which are external to Bitcoin blockchain and the actual uh, part of client validated data to verify that the commitment done in a proper way. And we also need to uh, verify that the actual witness transaction is not just a transaction out in the wild, but it is already in Bitcoin blockchain or a recent state of the Lightning Network channel. So, with this, we can build a chain of seals. Uh, I would apologize because the terminology here is a bit outdated, like root proof, and it is genesis state, and proof P1 is a state one. Uh, unfortunately, it is an Im image, so I can't easily I can't easily edit it, so I remind it. Uh, we can build a chain of the state changes over the transaction. So we have a seal, a seal uh, attached, defined for some transaction output. And another transaction, this one, spending this output, puts inside of it a commitment to the new state. And this state defines new seal, which is again spent by another transaction <coughs> committing to a state that defines new seal. So here, what is important is that we are breaking transaction graph with transition state and client validated data. We don't follow the transaction graph of the Bitcoin. We can allocate these seals, define these seals to any existing transaction output which we control, which may be know how connected to the transaction that is actually closing over the previous seal. So this allows us to move to break the movement of the value from the transaction graph of the on-chain data, which will work well in uh, disabling chain analysis tools. Then, additionally to creating a chains of uh, state transitions we can do a tree of state transitions. So, for instance, with the some state, here it is P3, we can define two different seals allocating different parts of the state to these seals in different transaction outputs of different transactions. And then we will have a branching of the state. And it can come back even to creating not a tree but a deck, uh, actually, of the seals highly interrelated, involving different genesis states, because they can cross at the transaction level and at the seal level. So now we basically have a sharded DAG on top of Bitcoin blockchain, sharded DAG of the uh, client validated state for RGB. It's form of sharding made right, not at the blockchain level. Uh, these shards can cross-sect when we have a shards from different genesis states, so each genesis state defined, defines its own shards. And sometimes they can uh, merge at the level of the same seal. And this is important thing how the client validated state diverge from the single use seal, because single use seal is a very specific primitive when you have a single seal, something, and a single message, you close the seal over. Uh, so we have to address a few points here. First, how we will define the state data? Yeah. It is.
Yeah, it is always. Uh, we need to address how we will define a state data, and we need to define how we apply a single use seal concept to this DAG variant, where we ha can have a transaction spending multiple transaction outputs associated with different seals. Uh, a transaction may contain multiple defined seals, and these seals may be created under multiple independent genesis states. So they are all like cross-sect. And the problem here is that, as you remember, let's assume we have a transaction. This transaction closes the seals originating from different genesis state. And it also, uh, it also has to commit to all those seals under different genesis states with a different entropy level. And it can happen that some of them will require a commitment to be placed in the same transaction output. But at the transaction output level, we can commit only to a single message, as you remember. We have designed all that structure to prevent double commitment, meaning that we have to pack the in, in related state into the same structure, into the same message, forever merging independent uh, histories and leaking the privacy at very different levels. So this problem can be solved only with a zero knowledge proofs. And that's why the third part of our sections is related to zero knowledge. How we can utilize it to prevent the transaction, the, the information, private information leaking at the level of client validated data of chain. Uh, and I would like to start with explaining a bit uh, background on what cryptographic primitives we can use for zero knowledge. I will start with a Peterson commitments. So am I sure that we have like half an hour before the lunch? Uh, am I right? Okay. Uh, do I need to slow down? Okay. So Peterson commitments. Uh, what are they? We already know what is commitment. We can embed them into some containers. Uh, a new primitive in the commitment uh, sphere is the homomorphic commitment. So if we have two commitments, and we sum these commitments, we will receive the third valid commitment to the original two facts. So the commitments which we can add on arithmetically and still receive uh, a valid commitment, that is a Peterson commitment. Uh, prover can prove to verify that uh, some function over a set of commitment, a linear function over a set of commitment is valid without providing all the original facts. Uh, it works under the DLP assumption. So in terms of zero knowledge, it's quite uh, good because uh, most forms of the zero knowledge, they are probabilistic, meaning they are not, uh, they are working under the weaker assumption with a some certain probability. And it will be correct to name them not zero knowledge proof, but zero knowledge arguments, while the proof is something that can be proven no in non-probabilistic way. So uh, the Peterson commitments are operating not under the probabilistic assumption, but under the deal with discrete logarithm problem assumption. Uh, so am I right in this part? Yeah. All right, hopefully. Uh, how we can construct a prudence commitment? We need to select elliptic curve. We already stick to one with the Bitcoin and Lightning. We have no other options. We need to select now two generator points. Uh, previously, we had a single generator point, G, point G. Now we need to pick uh, another one, which is H, usually denoted. And how we the most important part that these generator points shouldn't be related. So we shouldn't be able to find a private key which connects, uh, which uh, converts G into H. Uh, and the best way of doing that uh, is the same way like we discussed with the taproot. You just take the hash of the X coordinate of the G uh, point and use this as a definition of the x uh, coordinate for h point, meaning that you don't know how they are related under DLP assumption. Uh, yeah. How? You don't know the private key. You know, you, so you basically derive them in a different way. 
you, you just picked random H point because this is a hash as a random oracle. Yeah. Uh, it is defined under the elliptic curve standard. Well, uh, the, the funniest thing that we are still not sure that uh, SEC P uh, 256K1 uh, doesn't contain any backdoor in definition of the its parameters or generator points. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, the generator point is, is secure, but I'm talking about the elliptic curve uh, discrete logarithm problem. But okay, anyway, uh, let's proceed with the Pedersen commitments. Uh, to commit to some amount, meaning the sum scalar value A, uh, we need a random to select a random blending factor X. And the actual Pedersen commitment is a public key on this elliptic curve appearing from the sum of two other public keys. The first one we create from the blending factor and the original generator point, and the second one from the actual scalar we would like to commit to and the H generator point. So the Pedersen commitment is the public key. And uh, because it is the public key, it inherits all that homomorphic property properties on public key additions, which we were discussing yesterday. And if we have uh, two commitments, C1 and C2, as a public key, we can add them up, receive the third public key, C3, and at the same time, we can do the same operation for our private key, meaning uh, the blending factor and the amounts. So the sum of the amounts and the sum of the blending factors will allow us to generate C3, th C3 from two generating point directly. With this, Alice can prove to everybody that her transaction does not produce any new coins, meaning that you use Peterson commitments to commit to the amounts and you can prove that the sum, uh, sum of the amounts is equal to the sum of the outputs, or the sum of the inputs is equal to the sum of outputs, without disclosing each particular input and output. However, there is a problem here. Amounts can be negative. Why they can be negative? Well, because uh, with a elliptic curve, we have 32 byte integers, meaning 256 bit integers. Bitcoin amounts are 64 bit integers. So everything that is larger than 64 bits can be used as uh, interpre interpreted as a negative number. And uh, we can do this math. Like we, sum, we have two inputs, one Bitcoin each, the sum of them is two, and we have two outputs, one of them is seven, and the other one is minus five. And we just have created uh, five bitcoins out from nowhere. Uh, so the, the Pedersen commitments are not working by themselves. So confidential transactions working with the Pedersen commitments had to add a range proofs. Meaning, what are the range proofs? Is a uh, ability to prove that the actual number under the Pedersen commitment lies under the certain range. And there are two existing ways to construct the range proof. The first one is uh, Borromean Barami ring signatures for, um, pro uh, for range proofs, and the second one, bullet proofs. And uh, originally, the first one was used uh, in uh, Monero. The second one is a part of Mimble, Wimble, and Green for now. What, are, what is the difference? And also, confidential transactions in the current version, they use Burmian signatures. Borromean signatures, the name comes from these rings. These are Borromean rings. They are like three intersecting rings. Uh, it is a list of proofs that given number is within the range from zero to two in the power of 64. Basically, it's 64 signatures for each of the bit. Uh, and on top of this signature, we apply a multiple optimizations to reduce the size of the proof. I'm just giving very high level uh, description. The actual mathematics is more complex, but the end result, we get a really l large size of the proof 
that the original uh, that the outputs are within the range of normal Bitcoin amount. To address the problem with the size of the proof, uh, bullet proofs were created. They are designed by Stanford University, University College London, and three members of Blockstream. Uh, they are non-interactive, non zero-knowledge proofs that require no trusted setup. So you already heard about ZK SNARKs. They are also non-interactive, zero-knowledge proofs, but they do not require the trusted setup. They share the same problem. Like I said, they are probabilistic. So they are arguments, not proof, frankly speaking. Meaning that they don't uh, operate under DLP assumption, they operate under assumption that there is always a probability that the proof is falsified and specially constructed. It is a small probability. You can compute this probability, uh, however, you need to take the risk with these proofs. Uh, also, verifying bulletproof is more time consuming than doing verification for the case snarks. Uh, so, comparing to the uh, to Burmian ring proofs, they are smaller. Comparing to the case snarks, they are, do not require a trusted setup, but they are require more computational. Um, power to verify. Uh, they right now they are already used in Monero and Mimblewimble, uh, and they are planned to be a replacement of the Burmian range proofs uh, with the next version of confidential transactions. Uh, they're so efficient uh, because, additionally to the space efficiency, bullet proofs uh, can be very efficiently aggregated across many inputs or across the block. So for instance, if you use a bullet proofs to shrink the size of cryptographic proofs for confidential transactions, you can reduce it from 10 kilobytes to one kilobyte. So it's mo 10 times more efficient than bullet proofs. And unlikely, bull uh, uh, oh sorry, mm, 10 times more efficient than uh, Burmian range proofs. And unlike Burmian range proofs, they have uh, multiple applications outside of range proofs. So bullet proofs can prove any uh, arithmetical circuit, meaning that you can use them to prove anything that can be converted into mathematics. Not only range proofs, but nearly everything. Uh, and the plan is to use the stack of confidential transactions, replacing Borromean ring signatures with uh, uh, bullet proofs and adding Pedersen commitments. So by using that, we can hide the amounts of the assets. Because with the state transitions, uh, each owner will see the whole state defining uh, and the state of all the previous owners because he, is, he has to be able to count all his coins from the very beginning that nowhere on this road the new coins were created. Meaning each time you transfer your state to somebody, the new owner will see your ownership structure and the structure of all previous owners. With the introduction of uh, Pedersen commitment and bulletproofs, we can make this information as confidential as they are in the confidential transactions and as compact as it is in uh, Mimblewimble. Validated data, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it is It is still a large volume of data comparing to what is usually stored on-chain, but we are not storing that on-chain. That's, that, that's the happy point. And uh, by joining the best of two worlds, uh, confidentiality from confidential assets, confidential transactions, Mimble Wimble, and uh, client-side validation from what we are developing, we can get the four, four dimensions of privacy. The first one, we will hide the amounts from everybody. The most of people wouldn't know even about existence of these state transfers, uh, but uh, those who will own them they wouldn't know anything about the amounts. They will be able just to count that the nowhere on the route from the genesis state to their own uh, state, a new assets were created. Um, you said a, a bulletproof has 
provide some protection to avoid some severe situations. Who would carry the cost of the education of the client? Uh, the client owning the state or receiving new state. Receiving new state. Not all the network. So if you own the state, you are the point who checks the state. Nobody else does that. Do we have a uh, proposed outcome for the next time? Not yet. Because I think as a union, you actually you should like to a large amount of fees to verify all together. Because it's just because of the real issue we are just asking. So we will find the element we, we, we like multiple meetings. Yeah, we, with what I will be describing uh, later, you will only need because we will we get rid of all the data as much as possible unrelated so you get the linear structure uh well actually a graph of all direct routes between the owned asset and gen single genesis state and you need to verify through each of those routes that nowhere the new assets were created it is large but it is significantly still smaller than the size of blockchain Yeah. Well, I, I don't have estimates at this point. Okay. I, I just don't know. Uh, well, what we are what we are working on, I asked, uh, which also appeared to be very complex to compute, but I asked the graph of the USD tether. Uh, over the last few years, at least on Omni protocol. It can be extracted from the public source data. So we will know the average length from the issuance and how much at least pieces of state transitions we have validate. And when we will know the average size of state transition data and the average time to validate, we can just multiply them and get the estimates. So for now, uh, I it's hard to tell. Uh, there are few ways to mitigate that. It doesn't grow over the lightning channel. The history is, re you replace the, the last one, yeah. It grows only with on-chain transactions. It doesn't grow with a even transaction when you multi-hoop, yeah, because you're replacing the re recent state. So that's why Lightning is a scalability for us as well. So we, as scalable as the bottom layer. Um, okay. Where is the trade-off between data size and verification cost? What is the main trade-off? Well, I think data size is more important unless unless the validation costs became some I, I just don't know how long it would be worth to validate bulletproofs. Why is it the because you have to transfer the whole history uh, upon the transaction. Right? Yeah. Yes. What, for instance, I would like to pay you some USD tether. Let's take this. I need to, so I say I'd like to pay you, you give me an invoice, and you have to make sure that I do own yes, so this I asset. And I need to transfer that to you. Yes. And uh, if you, we use both mobiles, like you are a merchant and I am a payer, it has to be done over NFC or mm -hmm. directly. So it would the transfer of the data should uh, take more than like a second or two seconds. Mm -hmm. So if it, it is a gigabytes, it wouldn't work like that. But there are multiple optimizations on the on that size. I, I will be covering them throughout the day. So at this day, I don't have the exact computation how much it would be data. But after we will discuss the structure of the data and. No, 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 no. L l just wait a moment. Let's go till the end of the date and. You ask me all the information that I will be 
spending hours to describe later. Just let's come back to the question of efficiency and size uh, at the end when we, we, we will know what are those data we are working on. So uh, we are making uh, amounts confidential. Also, we're making confidential the fact of the transaction, which is impossible under any other protocol. Uh, so because of the client validated data, and uh, these commitments, they are unseen at the level of blockchain or even within the channel. Um, also, we, you know that we define the transaction outputs as a seal definitions. So mainly, you will be able to see, as an owner of uh, the asset, you may be able to see all those who own the asset before you what addresses they were owning on the Bitcoin blockchain. So with the plain proofs, you will leak some confidential information between the ownership of the addresses linked to the ownership of the assets that you own. Uh, we can significantly reduce this leak because uh, all those seals uh, will be merkelized. So you will see only a direct route and not all other outputs that were receiving some assets from the history. And finally, if you own different uh, assets of different genesis states, uh, coming from different genesis states, and you transfer them further, you don't link those histories, and you can commit to multiple transfer, not disclosing which particular assets are you transferring. And this is done with another form of Peterson commitments uh, and uh, encapsulated multi-asset transfers, which we will be starting covering right now. So what is the problem with that? Uh, Bitcoin transactions closing multiple seals over multiple asset transfers, I would name this more simply, or not messages, but asset transfers, they are linking unrelated proof histories from different graphs into a single graph forever. So let's assume I'm getting Apple shares and um, USD Tether under the same transaction output. I, do, I have the same transaction output and I would like to allocate both of them there. At this moment, uh, whenever I would like to transfer USD Tether or Apple shares further, I will have to disclose to both new owners both of the histories. So I wouldn't receive a USD Tether, but now I receive the history of USD Tether plus the history of Apple shares, which I don't need know, to know. And this like growing like a snowball, the amount of off-chain data. So we have to separate those together. They shouldn't be related anyhow. And uh, it also, not just a storage impact, but also privacy impact. However, just recently, over yesterday and this morning, we have designed the protocol for, as best as we can, uh, singular commitments. So you can't double commit, you can't double spend. So you have a message, plain message, to which you commit at the single point of the transaction, spending that seal. How to avoid this collision? We are avoiding this with the LNPBP4, which is kind of multi-message commitment scheme with a probable zero-knowledge pro properties. So the idea that you unite different commitments into a single message and you hide the information of different parts of this message, of course by hashing and doing other things. However, you have to prove that if I am transferring USD Tether, there is only a single message transferring USD Tether across all the messages that I am committing to. So I am not transferring the USD Tether to somebody else everything that I am transferring uh, goes under the same message. And I also don't want to disclose what other assets do I own at the same moment. So I would like to commit, I, I would like to prove that there are no other transfers, but I do not want to disclose what are those other transfers and what are the, those assets. And it is possible to be done with the Pedersen commitments, but it requires a specific uh, protocol which is not standardized and not existing yet. Yes. No, no. Let me join. Um. 
So here is a transaction. Here is transaction output. On this transaction output, I have two states. Let's name it USD Tether with the whole graph of previous ownership and at the same time uh, Apple shares with the whole graph. No, because uh, I was receiving them, I defined the same seal for both of them. For sure. Because with a seal definition, I'm using existing transaction output. And nothing prevents me to use it multiple times. I just don't want to create new transaction. I have an output. Why don't I need to create a Bitcoin footprint just producing unnecessary transaction outputs? So I have all my assets under this. There could be many others. And now I would like to pay $5. That's all. So, but when I spend this transaction output, I need to tra commit to the new state within this new transaction. And this state must be closed over all of those seals. So it should be listing all new transaction outputs, which will own all of these assets. So only one of them will go to a new owner, 5 USDT, and the whole rest of all other asset types will go back to me into different transaction output. But this state should need to list all of these assets and allocate all the new seals. And the, this new owner will receive this state, plain text. And he will see, oh, he has all of that stuff inside. I don't want to link this. Also, he will need to have this graph as well, while he is not owning uh, Apple shares at all. So, what we are doing? We are doing the following. For each asset, meaning Genesis state, we create a separate state message listing all the seals. So we have multiple, in this case two, state messages state data structures for USDT. It lists two new transaction outpoints, one for five USDT and the other for the rest, which is mine. It remains mine. And Apple. Again, only me. Now, I do commit to them with a hash procedure. And I get some hash. Then I can provide a new owner this plain text, oh, th th then I hash them together once again, and I get this commitment message for the LMPBP protocol. So I use it in public key tweaking and all that procedures. Now, I need to provide the new owner just this plain message, this hash, and that's all. And he can verify. He doesn't know what assets are here. Everything fine until I can easily create a saying that it's some other asset and distribute the same USDT producing actually a new USDT and he will not see this. So just I, I don't need just to hash them. I need to commit and prove that these assets are of different type. But at the same time, I don't want to disclose what are those assets. How it can be done? Well, each asset or genesis state will have some ID. Anyway, name, whatever. And we easily convert that into 256 bits with a hash function. So each asset is a number, large number. But this large number exposes which assets do I not own. So what I do, I do a Pedersen commitment to those numbers, like to amounts. It is not amounts. But now I need to prove, because I'm using blending factor, and it will be different for different commitments, it's, I can't just see that all the Peterson commitments are different. It doesn't say anything. What I'm doing, I'm doing, I will explain the logic, and then I will go into the protocol details. What I'm doing, I'm doing the, like, 
minus x2 multiplied by x1 minus x3 multiplied by x2 minus minus x3. Uh, if it is zero, basically, some of them are similar. So the, the mathematical logic behind that, there should be no pairwise zero difference in the original number of assets, but I need to count on blending factors. How it can be done? So we have already identified each asset with a sum number. We have created a person commitment and we have chosen random blending factors different for each of the assets. Then we compute a pairwise dif di uh, how to say that Differ differences pairwise differences uh, for each of the pairs and we get a number I, I denote these differences which are also a public key as a C Y J between uh, C I J between assets I and J. I disclose all the C I Js and the blending factors, but not the, the blending factors. They are private key, not uh, anything else to verify. So it may check that uh, the difference is not equal to the blending factor. Because if it is equal, it means that the assets are the same. But I provide not the blending factors, but the differences on the blending factors. So I can't restore the information. Sorry? From the differences? Probabilistically, you mean? Not sure. There is. Have you to go wrong when you can perform all the other steps by saying that the step number two is zero? Maybe you can see that you can see that you have to do zero. So, for instance, we have a set of numbers. only B1 minus B2, B2 minus B3, and B1 uh, minus B3. He can reconstruct from this information this. Yeah. 
Like he's a sea cow. I can come afford a a sleek a shaven Plato. Yeah. Which, by the way, the the magician of Pontus was not the only one um even if you have no history of Pontus you can at least find information about the death of many good people. But it's not one of those things. It's a one step before. Uh the other one is by the the Illyrian Empire. Uh where you have the giant but here you have two dudes with the most power and the other guy and It's not it's it's Illyrian stuff. Oh it's Illyrian stuff. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, then I'm So if you discuss it, let's say you walk up in court, you come into the uh, the museum or market, it's the problem you're trying to solve. And the person is trying to solve this problem with some form of credit information and and something that is precise. Because if you can reconstruct the building patches, then you can reconstruct. Well, you still can't reconstruct the asteroid you don't ideas, but you can have a rainbow. <coughs> yeah. mm-hmm. Rainbow shape. Because all we will know if we will reconstruct this bead, all we will know is basically asteroid ID multiplied by the home screen. Yeah, but that is secure under the sea cap. It is secure under the sea cap, yes. The point is that there is finite, finite number of atoms. Mm. So for Apple sales, everybody will know it's this, and I can, like, there are just a million of atoms. I have written proof to show you, and I have brute force hands on the table in front of me. So you can, you have an actual connection. I mean, there's basically two eyes and there are, you know, there you have an actual connection, and then you can subtract the two and make an eye, and instead of getting Let's not talk about this while we're talking about this. basically prove that and then you can prove that you know and then the only way that you know R1 minus R2 is what so, so what what are we proving and what are we what are so this these are separate yeah I know sorry these are separate domains to the to the to the same battle to the to same the battle to, to, B1, to, to B1 to B1 to B1 it's B1. a building patches it's a, oh okay well wh- whatever the asset is whatever the yeah, asset so is. we have a commitment to a service information yeah yeah and as we just make sure <laughs> you can the service yeah okay we have asterisk, and well we have a. L- l- let's say we have a one, a second one, a two, a three. That's okay. how we can make sure. It's just it, but more just like for here we we make two. Uh, to make it one with uh, R A one and R A two. Two R A one. These, These are blinding factors. factors. These are blinding factors. Two blinding factors. Two blinding factors. Because okay. we get because then we get. Like as in, it, it's just A1 plus B1, uh, right? Like that. Yeah. So this is this is one, and then this is two. So we uh, play two 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 different dimensions. Two, two different, different dimensions. Blinding factors. So different well. blinding factors, and then you can. Uh, I don't know if it helps, but then if we subtract the two, then we can basically show that we know R A1 minus R A2. Right. And then. Formulate the math, the the proof in terms.
terms of I or one minus I, it's usually mm-hmm. it's all going to multiply itself. You mm-hmm. can so maybe there's a way to you yeah, know, do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then and then you only yield to this minus I. But I, I don't know if it's worked out the other way either. Okay, what I propose if uh tomorrow or until tomorrow I would think of that, if we have time we can also think how we can use Buddhism commitments to hide the information about assets. Well, we can hide la- that even today, but the rainbow table is possible. So we can either, we need to introduce a uniform randomness to all of the uh, asset IDs or uh, to prevent rainbow table or to find a way how to prove with the Peterson commitments that the assets are different. I, I think it's possible. We, we just need to find the, the proper structure for the proofs. Okay. We, that is actually was the workshop. <laughs> <laughs> I propose to make a break. Lunchtime. Yeah, lunchtime. Okay, uh, so uh, the next part will be state transition details. So we dig into what is the state, how it is defined. Uh, before that, uh, we had this discussion on the LNPBP, how to separate the privacy of different assets. I would like to recap that we, we still have to design the protocol for that, maybe based on Peterson commitments, maybe not, but even without that protocol. Uh, for the most of the cases, the asset information and history do not leak because th- with each protocol, with each asset, we have a protocol-specific entropy. And it allows us to put uh, the commitment to the new state under different transaction outputs. So these graphs will run in parallel and they pass uh, through the transaction on through the different transaction outputs. And you can even play with the number of transaction outputs just to separate them. It is the first thing. No, if so, there will be really rare cases when you wouldn't be able to do that. So, if you spend a seal, seal with multiple assets, you have to commit to the new state under different transactions output, and you have sufficient way of doing that. If not, uh, which would be a rare occasion, we still RGB still will require much less space than blockchain. Uh, there will be no problem of intermixing on Lightning channel at all. So, if you do Lightning channels, the problem is not there. Uh, it is RGB is more private than uh, blockchain or even confidential assets, even with this problem. Uh, but of course, as a cypherpunks, it would be better to find a way for efficient zero knowledge asset hiding, even in such rare cases. Okay, so let's go back to this transition state transition details. So how we can store this of chain straight transition information? Which kind of data we need to have there? First of all we need to list the d- new defined seals, namely transaction output and uh, transaction outputs, uh, transaction IDs and number of outputs. We need to define an associated steel state bound to each seal. For instance, in case of the asset, it is the number of assets owned by each transaction output, owned by each seal. We can potentially add a script associated with the seal of the whole state, I will describe this part later. We will think about whether it is a good idea or not. And there should be also metadata covering all the seals. Well, we don't always will need a metadata, but in some specific cases, like for instance, uh, initial issuing of the asset, we may define uh, with the metadata the name of the asset or provide other information, which is not seal specific, but is specific to the protocol or to a specific uh, set of seals. So uh, let's go then f- through the seals, through the metadata, scripting, and the state at- attached to seals. Let's start with the seals uh, and the state. The state should be always bound to a seal because it is an owned se- state and it is owned by the owner of the transaction output. Uh, each new state owner will have independent seal and part of the state. So when I do own some asset and I would like to transfer, I do commit to the new state and I need to assemble this new state, but the information on the transaction output will be provided to me by the new owner. 
And even at this level, what we can do is that the new owner can hide information from me by providing a hash, and I will attach it to the hash, and later the new owner will need to disclose for the future owners only that, then the whole transaction output uh, with transaction ID. We also need to obscure the exact seals to enhance the privacy. So if I'm paying to 10 people, each of them need to see only their own transaction output, not the others. We can do that by merkelizing the whole structure of the seals. So when we define the seals, uh, there could be multiple seals, but we can still hide them from each other because they are owned by different parties. Um, what kind of state we, we can attach to the seals? Well, at the bottom level, uh, there are only two possible states, like the amount, meaning that what is the difference between amount and an integer? Amount is something, it's always a fraction of something whole. The whole is a total supply. The amount is the fraction of the total supply. So it should follow some particular laws, like the number of inputs, the sum of inputs must be equal to the sum of outputs, so no new supply is created. So it's a special type uh, integer. But with RGB, we are not limited only to that case. We can actually attach any arbitrary byte string to the seal and define meaning under specific protocol that uses RGB. For instance, in case of, uh, if it is the case of, I don't know, maybe for electricity, each has to be able to issue something and sign some information on the issuance of the electric electricity he produced. And basically, this signature will be the blob of the data attached to the seal. And we don't need to follow this equivalence of the sum of inputs and sum of outputs. And I will be dis um, discussing this more in more details under the scripting sec sec uh, section. Uh, now, when we attach seal to the state, seals are merkelized. But do we need to merkelize state? Well, unfortunately, we can't. Because if we use amounts, we need to make be able to make a sum of amounts and compare it to sum of the outputs. But however, in this case, instead of merkelization, we can use confidential transactions from with the bullet proofs, as it is done today in confidential transactions. Or, uh, well, they don't use bullet proofs today, but the next version will use, and bullet proofs are used in different protocols. So we can combine bu bullet proofs with confidential transactions and create zero knowledge proofs on the amounts. So we wouldn't disclose amounts; we will disclose Pedersen commitments to those amounts plus range proofs for amounts being actually in range. Mm. There is an interesting opportunity here, which I would like to discuss with you. With Bitcoin, we know that Satoshi uh, limit is uh, 40 to 46, 64 bits. So we have this overflow problem, and that's why we need a range proofs. With RGB, if we define a state as a new type, we can define it as a 256-bit integer. And then we wouldn't have an overflow problem, as I assume. And we wouldn't need a range proof part, which consumes a lot of space, much more than 32, bu 32 bytes occupied by an integer. Do you have, well, it's my uh, understanding of this problem. So do you think it is right? So can we get rid of the of the range proofs by just sp specifying that any amount should be a 32-byte integer? So we can't run into overflow condition and, don't do and we wouldn't be able to double spend and issue new. Yeah, but means that mm. 
on the asset depends only a total supply. So for instance, we have USDT with $5 billion total supply. But they are split. So we need to, the input is five, the first state transition, which is genetic state, input is 5 billion, which can be presented as a U32 uh, byte integer. And the output should be equal in their sum. But it, all, it is also U256 integer. And we can't put minus five because it is unsigned. You, you see the point? Because purchasing commitment as a private key, it requires a scalar of 256 bits. And if the amount is the scalar of that scale, you can't fit a negative values there. Meaning that you always be sure that the sum of inputs equals the sum of outputs. With Peterson commitment without any range proofs. And still, because amounts are Peterson commitments in confidential transactions, we already have a 32-byte integer. So we don't increase the size of the actual amount field at all. We just get rid of the range proofs. And with that, we are moving from the uh, probability zero-knowledge problem. So we can't, because the most of zero-knowledge protocols there, they have the probability assumption for their security. ZK snarks and confidential assets and confidential transactions, they all have this problem. Now we will rely only on DLP assumption of Patterson commitments, which is already relied on Bit in Bitcoin and everywhere. The question is, do if anybody of you knows the details of Mimble Wimble, because Mimble Wimble still utilizes the range proofs, why they didn't stick just to the same solution? Maybe there is some something that I just don't know and which prevents us from uh, avoiding any range proofs at all. Okay, let, let's leave that as an open question because it's, it's a very good optimization point. The next question is the scripting. Uh, it would be nice to maintain ability to add scripting conditions to the sales site in the future. So if we operate not on the amounts, but some other data with a script, we can apply additional validation rules. It is important to differentiate that the ownership rights, they are defined by Bitcoin outputs by the script there, and we can't overwrite the ownership. But in terms of internal consistency of the state, Bitcoin script doesn't anyhow defines the internal consistency. We embedding a type of amount into the transaction output, uh, into the state, and we define a rule as a part of the protocol that the sum of inputs should be equal to the sum of outputs. But the same can be done with the scripting. The genesis state may contain a section for the script which will be used to validate any future state transition. And this script may actually sum the amount in inputs and sum amount of outputs, and it will be part of the validation. So the validation of internal state wouldn't be the part of the protocol, but would be part of the genesis state and specific asset, for instance. Uh, that is another option. And with this option, uh, there will be a room for new types of the states. Maybe tomorrow somebody will invent some specific state again required for electricity, identity management, or something else. And that will be defined as a script of the genesis state. Or uh, if I'm working on the reputation system, I would like define, it's something like covenants in Bitcoin. It can be done with a such system uh, in RGB. So it's, it's a big uh, opportunity and I would like to, when I will finish this section in a couple of slides, it would be nice to hear your opinion about the scripting. Is it required? Because we can start without a script at all. We have these amounts, some commitments, and that's all. But we can start the other way. We can reserve the field for scripts and don't, and not use it right now, have the embedded type of byte string and amount. And in the future, we will introduce the script. Or we can have just a single type byte string 
and the script will define the rules to validate the state, including the amounts as a particular uh, script. No, and that what it could be. Well, the, the, the best option is simplicity language. Uh, it was proposed and developed by Russell, Russell O'Connor from Blockstream. Uh, Adam Beck and Blockstream, they plan to include it into Elements and later Liquid. And uh, Adam Beck named it as soft fork to end all forks. Why? Because it is very compact, it is Turing complete, and it allows, for instance, definition of Schnorr signatures as a few kilobytes only. And it allows libraries, so you don't need, like, issue the, the list the whole script in each genesis state you can have a library system again governed by rgb and you will just reference procedures it's a kind of smart contracts of chain with the turing complete language and uh com comparing to other languages it have very strict formal semantics it is formally verified language and you can prove not that it only uh, that it, you you just not prove deterministically the result of the computing and the computing is actually valid but also you can prove statements about computing complexity time and space consumption uh, and it is also very succinct meaning that you can implement Pedersen commitments Schnorr signatures whatever required in a very efficient way so basically you create protocol that you would never need to upgrade at all unless there is some security bug, DLP assumption broken or something like that. But it's much e more efficient when you need to upgrade protocol when you decided to introduce new type of uh, reputation system or something like that. Yeah. Yes, that's true. That was the whole idea of this tagging. It was a uh, strong recommendation by Peter Todd. Just don't create a single RGB protocol. Create a set of layered protocols with the tagging so you can easily replace whenever required some of them, not creating this all single hard fork across the system. But there is another counter-argument. Uh, we can easily define very flexible protocol. Uh, but we can get into the Ethereum problem when you have too many complexity and freedom of choice for end users, so they choose not the most efficient way, but arbitrary one. And uh, if we think that there is a best practice, it should be encoded as a part of the protocol rather than allowing them. We can say that, okay, we have this tweaking procedure. You can now issue as assets underneath it. Whatever you like, like just say I issuing mi in text million dollars, and this is an asset. Like it's a protocol. So, but we create all these all details that there is a state, there is a seals, that there is a metadata, the rules between them, and and so on, so on, just to prevent poor practices. We have here C twenty for that. Uh, so, while we can use different languages, some people will use Wasm for sure. And here we have no formal verification, no execution constraints, non-succinct. Non uh, it is maintained outside of Bitcoin Cypherpunk community, actually. And it has different goals. It is a web language, not financial world language. But people will use it. They use it for Polkadot, or Cosmos, whatever, I don't know. And uh, they're happy with that. They will be like saying, no, we should use Wasm. Or they say, okay, not Wasm. Like, why not use Plutus from Cardano by IHK? It is a subset of Haskell. It is uh, has the most of simplicity qualities. It is non succinct. It is uh, younger than simplicity, not that verified. It is a commercial project. No plans for adoption in other Bitcoin protocols, but people will use it. And people will issue assets and there will be a problems with that assets and it will be RGB protocol who will be claimed for that prob problems. There is even better option. We can bring EVM and Solidity, aren't we? Because these magical creatures, I like this slide really. Uh, we have 
So Magical World, Whisper, Swarm, Sharing, Turing Complete, Accounts, Proof of Stake, Plasma, Raiden, ERC20, DeFi, Apps, uh, DAO, everything. And it will come to RGB with this scripting tag and Solidity and EVM. Uh, so, yeah, the tool is just... Uh, we are coming out to be jealous for Ethereum magic, I know, <laughs> with RGB. <laughs> but uh, I think because we are toxic maximalists, we shouldn't allow uh, had that to happen. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It was a, a, a planned uh, you know, part to just get out of a lot of technical details. But let's, let's discuss this scripting problem in a more details. Uh, Russell O'Connor, <laughs> he's the only person in the world who understand it, and Adam Beck uh, were able to grab the general sense of what it is. Yeah. <laughs> okay. L let's list our options. Yeah, I I, I agree with, with this point. So our options are no script. We will have just amounts, and these amounts wouldn't be, we wouldn't have option of providing explicit amount or zero knowledge Pedersen commitment. It should be always Pedersen commitment. No other option for plain amounts. If you'd like to disclose this information, you attach the disclosure, you ensure that they, it is committed as a commitment, but you shouldn't have, we shouldn't repeat the mistake of uh, the cash uh, when you have ability to choose confidential or non-confidential. Uh, because the government and the law will say you shouldn't use confidential, it's illegal. And people will have a cho choice. If protocol can't use non-confidentiality, uh, that would be the single protocol that can be only confidential. Sorry? Yes. It is, but it's better to be legal completely than to be cut it into a different shape, which wasn't the... You, you have ERC20 already. Why do you need RGB? You have Omni. So yeah, well, it's actually it was discussed between why I'm presenting that like a decision because it's basically a decision made uh, when we was discussing with Adam Beck, uh, Peter Todd, uh, Paolo Arduino, uh, Giacomo Mazuko, and it's single voted by everybody who has who is financing and pushing this protocol for these years that it should be strictly confidential. If somebody wants to be RGB non-confidential, they can fork and do a non-confidential version. So, uh, no script with the confidential assets. The second option is uh, have a reserve place for script. Uh, but provide amounts, well, basically confidential assets already today without the script. So they are validated with uh, some specific hard-coded way. Uh, the third option is uh, allow simplicity, but do, well, there is no reason of if you have a simplicity to confidential assets outside of simplicity. And the third option is to allow other or multiple script languages potentially with a CAS out validated outside of the scripting. Uh, so, the risk with this simplicity is that it's not used yet. The good point is that it will be used in elements over the next year in this regard, and then in liquid. So Blockstream is working on that. If Blockstream is wor working on something, it's a high probability that they will finalize this work 
anyhow. Uh, because we have taproot, it is also dependent on a single person, <laughs> namely, or confidential assets, they were just depending on three persons inside Blockstream and nobody else outside of the, them were understanding them. Uh, I would say that because we, we need to launch before Blockstream will finish the work on simplicity, uh, we, we, we still need these confidential assets to be related outside of simplicity. So maybe I will vote for this option, reserve play for the script, for the simplicity script in the future, but provide uh, validation rules for confidential assets embedded into the protocol. So, so because we can't do it right now with the simplicity. Uh, but there are other options. Uh, no script at all. Ability to choose the scripting language by the issuing party. And yeah, that's all. Three options. <laughs> Develop and use language. <laughs> so. WebAssembly? It's not formally defined. It's not formally defined and formally specified and uh, formally verifiable language. I can't prove statements about the code written in WASM formally with mathematics. So it's. I, I do strongly believe that for financial world, at least, you can use only formally verifiable languages like Haskell subsets or specially designed languages like Simplicity. So there is, I, I can't name the other one. That's my argument. Yeah, well, WASM designed to run in the web browser. We don't need to... Uh, we can write the simplicity interpreter on WASM and run simplicity in browser the same way. Yeah. A formal verification of simplicity. Yeah. yeah. So the, the choice is actually no script at all. Is there any votes for this? Any reason why not to ever allow the script? W the, the script I'm saying here is not related to ownership. It's related for validating internal consistency of the state. We, by not introducing the script, we're fixing the rules for internal consistency on the script of the state forever for everybody who will use the protocol. Right now, it will be limited. The use of the protocol will be limited for assets. Well, everything that can be the fungible stuff plus collectibles. So we will launch the protocol and what we allow at the launch will be the only thing that will be allowed for, 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 for forever. Or we need to introduce a hard fork. The problem with the hard forks with the client-side validation is even larger than with the blockchain. Uh, first of all, everything is hard fork. It's not like you have soft fork option with blockchain. Second, uh, <coughs> well, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm wrong. Basically, it's not that. The style that is soft fork in blockchain is a hard fork in client side validation, and what is hard fork in blockchain is a soft fork in client side validation. I'll try again. It's, it's it's not my statement. It's it was the statement of Peter Todd. I was trying to understand it as well. I, I'm not sure that I got it completely. The idea is that the soft fork in Bitcoin is when we introduce in new functions that were absent, 
but still can be can be successfully computed with the older version, right? That fork is everything else. So when we upgrade the client validated state protocol and introducing new versions, a new things, for instance, scripting system, all the old clients wouldn't be able to validate these new transactions. You namely can't introduce anything new without breaking the protocol. And moreover, if at least at single point in time somebody will use new feature, all the future users has to be upgraded to that feature, even if they don't use it directly. Yes. Yes, yes. We can partially solve this problem with these layered protocols and tags. But again, it will limit the problem to the level that you just don't know this protocol and you reject the whole story forever, even if it happened at some layer in the past. Well, you still isolate the most of layers with merkleization and that kind of stuff, but Then you can do double spend or something. If it can, if it's it's either valid or not valid. There is because we are not doing the script that should evaluate to some positive result. We are relying on Bitcoin script for the security model. And the rest is basically what data do we providing to validate the state? We either provide the data or not provide. If we not provide. It is security leak, and you need those data. You can't positively validate without sufficient amount of data. Otherwise, it's you're doing something wrong. So I would say that it's better to introduce the script in the future, but not today, and limit it to formally verifiable languages. No, we will have zero script. So there is a field for the script. There is no tag to commit to the script, but uh, the script is empty. Z zero length script. But you have to upgrade all the clients to be able to support the script. Yes. Well, not anyone can, yeah, anyone, no, no, no. We, we are not saying who can spend. We are saying is the state is valid. Yeah, the state is valid until there is script which proves the invalidity of the state. Yeah, in that in that sense, yes. The point again, if there will be a software and the protocol is released and simplicity is not there, this software wouldn't be able to evaluate the script when it will be there. But it's it's easier because the software clearly has to be upgraded. It was already in protocol. It's just a new requirement uh, that there is a simplicity interpreter required and it's not in the software the clients will be asking for that. So, so there is no alternative to that. No, no, we should define which language it should be. But it will be, we are not just using this language. Because th we can't define it in future, like there is no organization that can say that all issued assets now can use simplicity of that language. It should be known at the moment of their issuance. So if tomorrow USD Tether will be issued, it have to be with the simplicity language accepted, but zero length of the, li of the script. Uh, 
Simplicity. <laughs> you're, you're making me. <laughs> I, I, I don't know the state of the simplicity release. Maybe there, it working, there is an interpreter, I just don't know. So I probably, because what I'm planning is to talk more to Blockstream guys to understand the points at which we can collaborate on the RGB and confidential assets. If they're planning to add simplicity to Liquid, to confidential assets, introduce bulletproofs and potentially use uh, client-side validation, which will be the RGB in fact, I mean, I, I'm not saying that it will be the same RGB, but they will be basically assembling the protocol with the same requirements and the same set of the technologies. So, and this for sure, because of client-side validation, would be able to work on Bitcoin. We will be, so the, the idea is that what we was discussing with Adam back is just to come down. We need to demonstrate what we have with RGB. Then we'll, they will review it and say, okay, we are fine. Let's work together on the implementation and or just let's change it here, here we have that arguments. So if they are planning to do simplicity, it wouldn't be like we are trying to do simplicity instead of them. It's like they are doing simplicity, not just for liquid, but also for for the other stuff. In the worst case, in the best case, it is the same protocol that confidential assets and RGB. Confidential assets version two, I mean. Because again, the version one doesn't have bulletproofs, doesn't have simplicity. There are two different upgrades we need to distinguish. The first is upgrade of the asset, of, of chain state. So if you introduce simplicity at the very beginning, but just empty length, it means that there is no upgrade on the state. The issued assets are valid under the protocol. It is just the wallets and software that have lacking the ability to either evaluate it. So they're not saying that it is invalid. It says we can't say valid whether it is valid or not. So if I am receiving the proof on the older wallet, it will report me, okay, I received the proof, I can't say that it is invalid, but I am lacking script uh, interpreter, simplicity interpreter to fully validate the state. It is the different, as it's reporting the state is invalid, it uses unknown field. So the first implementation of the wallet should be aware that at any moment there could be a script. But to be uh, make them aware, we need to define it at the moment of the protocol launch. It's not work. Yeah. 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 Like with the taproot, we we embedded taproot, but it's not there yet at all. But when they will met taproot and they don't have a part to evaluate taproot, they will say, "Okay, I'm not saying that it is invalid, but it is taproot. I don't know how to work with the taproot." It's the same problem like Wallace unable to work with the back 32 addresses. So it's not soft fork. It's not hard fork, I mean. They're just not supporting this part of the stuff. So let's put it that way. Are there any arguments against this route? So first of all, the language is defined as simplicity, not any other language. Because I just know the only other language which is Plutus. And I wouldn't say that it is out there yet as well. Uh, and the second, uh, should we add it from the beginning? Bitcoin script. With a diff uh, di uh, another upcode. So they uh, redeprecated, so the codes were deprecated. Concat, uh, add, subtract, and so on. They allowed them back. And they introduced new opcodes for confidential transactions, patterns, and commitments. Uh, no, as far as I know, because there is no specification on this new opcodes. 
In which way? Because. No, no, this language is not used for asset creation. It's it's Bitcoin transaction output, so it's all. No. Yeah, because uh, they, 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 they have nothing other than amount. They, there are no other conditions that they can limit. Here, if we, wouldn't ha if we would have something in the future that is not an amount, like a reputation system, we need some restriction, like in internal validity conditions. Well, it's not broad. It's less broad than the Rust. So if we will impl implement zero knowledge on Rust, there is more risk if we implement that with the simplicity. Because with the simplicity, we can formally prove that the implementation corresponding to the actual zero knowledge specification. With the Rust, we can just hope that we wrote code correctly. So the more business logic we will move on the validation of the state from the Rust into simplicity, the better it is. Other than Nobody knows simplicity to do it right now. We will be limited to the case that we have today, like financial assets and collectibles. Yes. Well, uh, uh, there are also all risks because our zero knowledge part will be forever implemented in Rust. And if we will find any problem, we can we can't do anything like back in the implementation of the of specification problems so simplicity when we have we, we, without simplicity all the protocol is defined at the rgb protocol level with the simplicity less stuff is defined as a rgb protocol most st stuff is defined at genesis state per state history so basically, if something goes wrong, USD Tether will be able to reissue new genesis state. Say everybody is giving me, who is giving me back that wrong USD Tether, I issue under the new genesis state and new version. And RGB protocol shouldn't change at all. They just replace state script in the genesis state. It's something like, well, it's bad comparison. I wouldn't compare that. And if simplicity is a poor language than Rust, I wouldn't recommend that. It's like if uh, Ethereum was written on Rust and Go and the solidity is worse version, there is no reason of moving the business logic from a Rust into the solidity scripting. It's better to do more in Rust on the base level. Here, sorry? So solidity. Solidity is poorer than Rust, but simplicity is stronger in terms of formal verification. So the more logic we have there, more sure that it is implemented at least at the correct way. Well, maybe somebody will bring in up uh, an argument that will show the different view. Okay, so. Seven. Uh, CA valuation plus simplicity support, but empty now. Empty script. Yeah, that's the result. So we do Pedersen validation of the amounts, Pedersen commitment validation of the amounts at the level of the protocol, RGB protocol. We know that there is an amount field and byte string field. 
but we don't validate byte strings, and all these validation rules will be defined by simplicity. And we can put it in even other way. If the script is present, it validates everything. If it's not present, we validate confidential amounts and don't validate the rest, assuming it is valid. Because by this, we can replace on the better and efficient version of confidential uh, amounts. Right? So no script, I mean empty script, means that it validates to success. And then every we add additional validation for confidential amounts. If there is a script, we don't validate everything, anything, and script validates all the required data. If it succeeds, the state is valid. If it fails, the state is invalid. If it is present. If not, by the rest. I mean by the core library. No. There is no upgrade to simplicity. It is already there. There is no just interpreter to run the scripts. The, and there is nobody to write it. Sorry? Oh, it will be like with a secret. If it will change, it will be like... In I'm uh, quite sure simplicity has some statements at the beginning, so it will be... Yeah, I, I think to discuss. Well, in general, I, uh, there is a bit need to discuss with the block stream this potential of simplicity as a scripting. Well, I discussed this with Adam back and said that, yeah, this is a great idea we should do that but all the technical details related to this process so discuss okay uh, at least we would not delay the RGB because of the simplicity with this route. This, wouldn't, this discussion wouldn't take long, but we at least will understand how we can do that in the future, meaning that we, we are ready for that. I am reiterating once again. So there is zero script. If there is no script, zero length script field, we evaluate with the known confidential asset rules as of today. If it is not empty, Somebody, there is interpreter already and people who are writing the code. The interpreter will know how to inter interpret this simplicity and it will either evaluate to true or to false. So if there is something wrong with our confidential asset code and the simplicity is out there, Bitfinex can just issue a new genesis state with a script implementing validation and migrate all the assets on them. Not if there is a script. But the script is in the genesis state. So the idea is that with the state. You have genesis state, and there are meta fields in genesis state. And one of those meta fields, these meta fields are applied to the whole history future. And one of those meta fields is the script field. And this script, if it is present, it defines how to validate the state attached to the seals by arbitrary logic which it defines. The, s the normal state transitions, depending on how you define the rules in the genesis state, they also may have a script. But it's how you define in genesis state. You may define that this script overwrites the script of the genesis script, or you apply first the script from the genesis script, validate, and then you can add on to that this specific script, it will depend on the particular type of the state you are issuing. So you think about that, if you, ha if you had any experience with Ethereum 
and smart contracts. It is the same system of the smart contracts. Just the difference, you're not writing the smart contract for all state transactions. You're writing the contract for each state transition, defining what can be changed by a particular state condition under this contract. It's covenants. So I think, yeah. So, like, when do you um, get the, um, the certificate that it does? So it would be like a proper upgrade on the client. Yes, yes. Um, Not reissuance of the assets. Yeah, yeah, software upgrade in the client side. No, no, they will, they should report that the state is not invalid, but we can't validate it completely. It will be up to client, they, it, it's up to the software implementation. It can leave to the client to decide, like with a cell, cell certificate. Uh, it is invalid, but would you like to proceed at your own risk, for instance? Or they may say, okay, we, we just don't understand it or something else. But the point is that there is different level of uh, social coordination required to do a protocol upgrade versus software upgrade. Because software upgrade is uh, vendor based. It is a private business creating the wallet and all the software. And it is their business decision. And if they see the clients wor wanting them, they will just do it. Whether when it is a protocol upgrade, you need a coordination across different private teams with the different goals and business models. And it's much harder to achieve that, as you know with Bitcoin fork story. So that's why it's easier to upgrade multiple independent implementations when it is already in the protocol, but just not there in, ter in terms of simplicity, interpretation, library, or whatever, than when you don't have any scripting language in the protocol and you okay we're now doing the second version of protocol please everybody implement it we're introducing your scripting you know how it works they are they will be aware from the day one when they adding support to rgb that the script in simplicity will be there and they have to upgrade their software at that point they are taking this rules of the play of the game at the very beginning It will be the same situation like with uh, uh, N-sequence in Bitcoin. I mean, oh, time lock field, one of those fields, yeah. It's not used. And then somebody else finds the way how to use it more efficiently. We need to do the whole social coordination on that decision. So it limits us from making stupid moves in the future also. Yeah, it's it's like with the Lightning Network, any anybody can create their own Lightning Network. But because of the network value, Yeah. The same as here. Yeah, that's yeah, but how many people are doing that in Lightning? So that's the point. The the technical ability to do something, <coughs> and that what actually market behavior, how the market behavior ca happens, it is very different things. Okay. And the protocol actually. If protocol makes something hard, because everybody can fork RGB as they want and do whatever they want with that. 
but at the end of the day it will work like there is so lot of effort required to work like with Bitcoin because that there would be examples of the product of forking but they wouldn't take off because of many external factors the For sure. You, you, yes, but you will utilize the same spectrum thing that I will be talking tomorrow as you t will utilize. Even if you introduce RGB into Lightning and you're trying to do multi-hop, you wouldn't find the path with a USD tether all across the route. So you use just two gateways. And the same will be for exactly the same for the, for the spectrum. But I will be explaining a schema right now. And I need to differentiate some really strongly. I had I didn't make a slide for that yet because I just understood right now that it have to be clear that we have three points of extension. The first point we have a protocol RGB. What we are working on right now, we are working on the protocol, and it product it the protocol says that Genesis state may have a metadata which define the behavior of the. Uh, asset issued under the genesis state and that is the point of extension now when we have a genesis state it can use its flexibility defined under the rgb protocol to uh, define a custom behavior for its own assets but there will be also standards saying that if you would like to issue shares here is the blueprint of the genesis state replace the name and just use it because it's best practice it's have corrected and the most cases all the companies who are issuing shares uh, they will be just using it as a template and then if you need something really custom like i need custom reputation system that does this complex script i don't using this template i define my own and the meta fields i'm saying that each state underneath me may also have a meta field customizing the behavior further under these rules and this is a meta rules of the uh, 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 making some constraints on the meta fields that can be present inside the following proofs even including the whole history of the proofs up to itself whatever so you have unlimited extensibility when you need it but by default you are not using it because it will create a very a lot of problems so you use a template that prevents if you have nothing in the field it just prevents from extending functionality down the ladder. So, because today we are unable to create a simplicity script which allows that stuff, it will be absent and there will be no point of extension. But later it will appear and those who will need it will be able to utilize it. So it's kind of middle ground between the endless flexibility of Ethereum and the strictness of Bitcoin where you can't just introduce new functionality in the most of the cases. And here you can introduce, but by default, if you don't need it, you can do it really simply and be sure that it will work correctly. But if you do really need, you have to invest a lot of energy, time, money to design it properly. Otherwise you will be broken probably. But nothing prevents you from doing that other than your own risk. And you will, the one of those risks would be that the software it will be able to validate, but only those software that is able to validate simplicity. So, right. Now a bit about metadata. Uh, actually, I have just described all of that. So this metadata is, uh, metadata can be present in Genesis state. 
and can be present in the future states. Which metadata may be present defined by the schema and which schema is used defined by the genesis state. So genesis state by that way defines what are possible metadata or none of them in their state transitions operating under this genesis state. And there is a predefined set of types for metadata like integers of different lengths, floor doubles of different lengths, arrays of these types and structures on these types. Meaning arrays is the homogeneous structure and uh, the structure is heterogeneous structure. Um, and also, uh, the semantics of this metadata are also defined by the schema. So the, the next part of the talk will be the schema. What is schema? Because state and schema are very important in relation to each other. So to summarize this part, final state transition structure will include number of seals defined by the state trans transition, Merkle root for the seals, because we don't need list of the, all of them, list of the state data for each of the seals, but for amounts it will be produced and commitments, not the plain amounts. Uh, metadata, maybe zero. A validation script by code and simplicity. Optional, but it will be not optional, meaning it just zero lengths, that means the absence. And the closed si and the closed seals closed by this transition, they are not listed in the off-chain proofs because they are read from the blockchain structure directly for the evaluation. So when you count the inputs, you are not taking them from the state transition. You are taking them from the previous proofs linked to this state transition through the blockchain. And that's all. Next, the serialization, and I propose to do a small break before that. Uh, yeah, serialization of this stru structure, and then the schema. On, on this section, I would like to discuss the serialization protocols, which are important of running the whole system and making it working. So. Before that, we were discussing which data should be kept in the commitment proofs, which we were mainly discussing yesterday, and in the state transitions, which we were discussing today. So we already have two off-chain data structure participating in client-side validation. Uh, commitment proofs, which are supplements to the information which we can extract from the transaction, and the state proofs. But we never said anything about how to keep them. It is even more important to understand was that with, with the use of merkleization, different people will have different data and information on the state history from the genesis state up to their own state. So it's not like we have off-chain data which remain the same like blockchain being transferred from the node to node or from the owner to owner. We are more talking in terms and defining the protocol in terms of the information which should be available to different participants and what information they require in order to validate both single use seal part, commitment part, and the state part. We have already defined that and all the protocols we were discussing so far operate under this concept. They say nothing how to store that information, how to serialize this information, or should it be a single piece, multiple pieces, how it should be transferred between owners. And that would be a different set of the protocols. Uh, there is three types of, of serialization in this regard. The first one is the commitment serialization. It is very important because it is used to digest the original message with the hash function and to commit to it. And here the byte order, the order of the fields is important because if you change the fields, the order of the fields, you will result, it will result in a different commitment which will be invalid. So this must be standardized and fixed forever. The network serialization is a different thing. When you need to transfer something, first of all, you probably would not transfer all the data. You will transfer only those data which are required to verify the commitment and which are related to particular asset that you are transferring. And it is an agreement between two parties. 
it's not a global pr it's not a protocol requiring global consensus on the actual byte order and storage serialization which is used to keep the actual off-chain data in an efficient way on disk these are three different serialization algorithm why because of this they have different requirements for trade-offs so i will find some pointer No, I, I, I tried, no. So, uh, we need to understand which type of the standards should define each serialization type. Are they important for consensus, meaning all the members of the system reaching the same result? Uh, any change in these standards, should it result, would it result in hard fork or not? Do we need to optimize the serialization protocol for storage, for speed, f uh, should we, uh, what is the potential attack surface for these protocols, and uh, make the single protocol cover multiple levels, layers of the RGB stack, which we were discussing like the layers, because you can serialize at the same time, in the same data structure, commitments, state proofs, genesis state, and whatever, or you can differentiate that in different pieces of serialized data. So should we need to do that or not? So let's analyze. The most important part is the commitment. It requires a standard at the level of LNPPP, meaning the industry-wide standard. It is extremely important for the consensus. It will, if you change it, you will lose the state or the assets with a high probability because you wouldn't be able to transfer it further. Uh, it, doesn't require you to optimize the storage because the only time you are doing uh, serialization is to compute the hash. After that, you throw out the data. They can be stored in the different way. Serialized for storage differently. Serialized for network differently. You need just need to put the data in the order to get the correct hash once in the memory. And uh, we do need to s optimize it for speed since we will do a multiple serialization consequently to verify the history of the state. It has a big uh, attack surface because it's critical for the consensus and it shouldn't cover multiple le levels because we have a commitment under specific standards. On each standard level we have a, a commitment protocol and we must serialize for that standard. Unlike to this network, uh, well, still requires the common standard because if we have different standards, it will be hard to transfer the data between different wallets. We already had the situation when there were no standards originally for Bitcoin wallets in uh, Bitcoin, and they were serializing public keys differently, seed phrases differently, and now they are still remain in not interoperable. Uh, it is important for consensus, but not that much important. Uh, and it, if we change the standard, we will just get broken communication. You wouldn't lose your asset. You will still be able to transfer it further to the proper client. But in this particular case, the communication with a peer will be broken. We must optimize to stor for storage because we use network traffic, unlike to the commitment. But we don't need to optimize for speed. Uh, of, of the serialization, because the speed of the serialization is always faster than the network transfer. Uh, we have smaller attack surface, that's why, and it may cover the multiple levels of protocol. So you may serialize all the data from all the levels, commitment proofs, everything all together to a single network packet, if you need. And the final is storage. We don't need a standard for a storage. It's vendor specific. They can co uh, compete with each other vendors to store more efficiently, compress the data, do whatever they want. Uh, it is not important for consensus at all. There is now no results of hard forks. It's problems of software developers. They need to upgrade their software to read uh, the data correctly from the previous version. We must optimize for the storage. We don't need to optimize for We have zero potential attack surface. Well, undefined, I would say. And we don't care. Would it cover all the layers or just a single layer le by level layer? So it's up to the vendor. Yeah. But if it, I mean, uh, 
yeah, potential attack, it would be that third party can introduce and change the data, the stored data, which will, for instance, break the software or create a backdoor or something. But again, this attack surface is not at the level of protocol, but at, at the level of developer. It's his headache, not our ours as a protocol designers. So here, it is our headache. That strong headache, intermediate headache, no headache. So, uh, we will need uh, different standards for serialization protocols. So, we will replace this one and we need to define two new ones. And um, let's start with a simpler thing, which is network serialization. What we need to, ser to serialize? Well, we need to st serialize ownership proofs, state transition history for a given own state, so when Alice needs to provide Bob with the proofs of her ownership of some state, she needs to serialize every other state from the genetic state to this state owned by her. And um, how she will serialize that will be specific to the underlying network protocol. Because some part of this data may be transferred over the lightning uh, gossip messaging, some parts of the lightning onion routing, some parts of the lightning messaging, and this have to be differentiated, and we will be covering that in more details tomorrow related to the lightning. While if you're not using the lightning, you will need to establish a separate communication channel. And even with lightning for some parts, for efficiency, you will be also needed a separate communication channel. So while it is uh, not vendor specific, and it can be serializing multiple layers of protocols, it will be a specific on the case, is it a lightning network? Is it multi-hop payment? Is it not multi-hop payment? Are we operating under the Bitcoin blockchain and so forth? So there will be standards depending on this. As for the commitment serialization, <coughs> we have <coughs> a different rules and we need to follow these pra best practices. Uh, we define this jointly with the Peter Todd. Uh, I wouldn't say that it is final list, so you're open to criticize it or suggest new points. The first point, we do not need and we shouldn't compress the data. We are committing to the data. We don't need to introduce in any uh, indeterm indeterminism. Then we should use deterministically defined value lengths only. There should be no variable length parts at the serialization level, or at least we must in, uh, avoid it as possible, including the nested uh, hashing and nested commitments, like we were doing in the protocols that we were discussing. Uh, there should be no pointers, offsets, and shifts, meaning that we shouldn't say that, okay, in two bytes, there will be the ne next, that data structure. There should be no linked lists, because they provide a strong uh, attack surface. Again, it's a separate topic. Uh, it's, it's, it's studied by Peter Todd, even under uh, some academic program, so I just trust him as a source of this knowledge. Uh, Merkle trees must also commit to the depths of each branch. Because otherwise, if you, ser if you Merkleize the seals, you can cheat on the number of seals. And you can provide, uh, you just don't know the depth of the Merkle tree. So you have to commit to the depth of the root and of the each branch. And in the type system, each branch should have specific type, each branch at each level. So there is a type for branch la level, like root branch, branch layer one, bla branch layer two, branch layer three, and so forth. Uh, we must define bounds for each type validity. So if we use a 32-byte integer, but it shouldn't be more than a thousand uh, or 16 by 16 bit integer, but not more than a thousand, it should be part of the specification. That if it is more than the thousand, even before the commitment verification, the actual commitment is invalid. Uh, it is must be composed of the nested digest to prevent the zero length attack. If you don't have a public key for HMAC procedure, we just use the double, the, the double hash. 
and uh, it must be prefixed with protocol specific tags before the commitment wherever possible. We have already discussed that. And first, eight bytes might deterministically define the length of the committed data. So when we are c creating a commitment, we put the length of the data to which we commit in the first eight bytes and we commit to the length of the data we are committing to as well, together with the actual message. Uh, well, that's why it is important to have a proper API, as we already discussed. It's not API for serialization, just example of proper API. Uh, now, let's, let's go how we can serialize the state and the other data to commit to. First of all, let's start with the state level of the state. First of all, we're serializing the number of seals. These first four bytes, probably eight bytes, as I just said, it should be eight bytes, so it's my mistake. Uh, define the length of the message. It's not the length of the data structure, but knowing, because each seal have a fixed data structure, by knowing the number of the seals, we compute the length of the whole message. Uh, so every, si every structure inside the state serialization will be fixed size, uh, fixed length value, and uh, we will have a lot of space for optimization via batching and framing of the hashes, I mean, of the hash functions. So after the number of seals, we commit to the, we serialize the Merkle root, 32 bytes of Merkle root, constructed through the Merkleization process out of each transaction ID, e the out. I'm not showing the whole Mer Merkle tree, it's quite clear. So, so this is a Merkle tree, not even uh, No, it's Merkle tree. And Merkle tree with the asterisk. Asterisk means that uses target hashes like beep top root and commits to the branch depth. Just not a Merkle tree, but with the target hashes committing to, to the depth. And, and can the, the, the level of depth reveal some sensitive information? No. We already know how, how much uh, seals are there. We can't hide that information at all. Uh, then, we are serializing state data, but we are not serializing the state data, we're committing to the state data. Even if the state data are Pedersen commitment, we are hashing it committing to the Pedersen commitment, because it could be a byte string or some different length of the data. So, we are type it, uh, the first byte defines the type, is it a Pedersen commitment amount or a byte string, and then we have a byte sequence, again of known lengths, uh, however, for byte string, we don't know length, so here we have no other option just to encode the length as at the beginning of the byte string. We do double hash to prevent length extension attack, and we do double tagged hash, actually, not just a double hash. Uh, and with this tag, we also commit, I'm not sure that do we need to commit to the type here and here, probably just double hash if we have a type, or tagged hash and no types yet, right? Yeah, I think tagged hash and no types here is better. Because first we convert this structure into fixed, uh, fixed length structure and then attaching a fixed length tag and then hashing once again. Um, yeah, so this will prevent from length extension attack. So we do that for all the state which we have. After that, we are uh, committing to the metadata. We are the same procedure. Uh, so, um, because we can have multiple metadata, it's not here on the scheme, we also will need to uh, Linearize, linearize the commitment probably because we don't need Merkle tree because we are not hiding any part of the metadata. Metadata should be readable by everybody who have this state proof. So I'm not sure that we need to Merkleize, but it will be probably easier in the terms of the commitment to Merkleize the metadata. How do you think? Because here we're Merkleizing for the privacy. Here there is no privacy considerations, but meta fields can be multiple. Should we Merkleize them or just put us a linear structure? Merkleization helps from the to, to have a fixed length at the most of the stages. 
while with a linear structure it have internal structure so internal structure should be better to split into the commitments so we commit first create commitments to each metadata field and then we merkleize those commitments not number on the on the seals because when for instance you 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 have this own state and you're transferring me uh use the tether but you have multiple outputs so like you split it all you use the tether across multiple outputs five dollars each and you transfer me only five dollars so i will own only one of those and the rest will go somewhere else so i don't know i, I shouldn't know where the rest has gone so i will know only the merkle root and the pass to my own seal and i wouldn't know anything about the rest of the seals No, for uh, for uh, everything, if they are present. Well, basically, if we are talking about USD dollars or USD tether or financial assets, in the state transition proofs, there will be no metadata. It it would be just empty field, like zero. We will commit to the absence of metadata, so we still will be doing the hashing and committing that there is no metadata, but uh, it will be an empty one. But in some other cases, or in Genesis state, we have a number of fields. I will be naming them like ticker, asset name, total supply, maximum total supply, uh, and the point, fixed point, I mean decimal digit, because you can have like divisibility less than one. So you have a fixed length. Um, integer value for amount but you can point where you put the floating point inside that so i think that mercalization will be better here no no you should reveal everything under the protocol but i mean it's simpler from the point of view like you have five fields you need to commit to each of them first so just not to connect them which is bad pr practice so you you create five hashes and then you need to convert these five hashes into a single one the best way to prevent length extraction attack in such commitment just use merkle tree because you buy two of them you're combining by two and that's all so merkle tree is, seems to be better and then we need to commit to the script here no merkle tree just a single script field uh, and for now it will be empty commitment meaning committing to zero length script yes and then <coughs> that's part of this lnp bp4 which we decide to rework on but it was thought that there will be a number of such state transitions genesis state id which we are so this is the experience and commitment to genetic state ID uh, plus proof plus state commitment coming as a target hash of this method. So if we have just a single state transition, we still create this part. If we have more, we create repeating this part for each of the state transitions. So here is first <coughs> commitment to state genesis ID that ID that we were talking about, state data commitment and proofs on the uniqueness of the each of the presence and commitments. Yeah, so why didn't you have the state data commitment for cash hash? It's already there. No, it's this in the structure. Oh, all of it? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we need to condense that into 32 bytes. It's my <coughs> mistake. <coughs> uh, it's not state data, it's uh, state. Let's name it differently. I 
and then prove that this there is no repeated uh, state, uh, sorry, genesis state commitments under the Pedersen commitments, which we haven't designed yet, but we hope that we will be able to design it. Uh, again, sorry, it's just broken. Yeah, we repeat this data as much as, uh, uh, as we need. And finally, we commit to this bulletproof for range proofs, which is not the case anymore again. And this one is a message for those protocols we were talking in the moment, in the morning, so we use this as a message for this uh, public key tweaking procedure, after which we embed the public key into the script, script into transaction output, transaction input into the transaction. So it's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, at least seven layers of the protocol. So that's all. And the last part is our schemata. Schemata define the types of the state transition because state transition may have different type. The types of the seals because seals can be of different type. I will showcase where it is important. It defines semantic for the state and simplicity script for validating the state. So that script that goes in genesis is actually part of the schema which is applied to each of the state. Uh, defines semantics for metadata and possible metadata field. Defines uh, and references simply script modules. If you know that there is some publicly known modules, you can just commit to them and say that we are using this library. Uh, like Schnorr signatures or person commitment, if we will move it to into the simplicity. It defines additional constraints on each type, on each state transition, like which seals the state transition may define, which state may be associated with each of the seals, which metadata are required, optional and prohibited, which additional scripts and with which constraint may be defined by this particular state transition. So it's rules for defining the rules. Uh, schemata are the actual requirements for the state transition validation outside of the level of Bitcoin script commitment. We allow multiple updates without software modification. No wallets, explorers, and LN nodes may accept new types of asset without any code changes. So it's what we were discussing with the simplicity language. It same applies to the schemata. But simplicity, uh, sch what schemata does, it defines which type of data you may have. And simplicity script validates that data like it can sum the number, the sum the amounts in the inputs compared to the amount of outputs. So it's a different level because the semantical validation can't be done with a script. Script does arithmetical and programmatical validation, while semantical validation is defined by the schema. Let's let's talk on the example. It's one of the early RGB schema drafts. I mean schema for financial assets. It's already outdated, uh, but I will just demonstrate how the general idea behind the scheme. So we have a name of the scheme, we have a version of the scheme because it can be upgraded. It's what I was naming the template for the Genesis state. Uh, we can reference a previous version of the schema uh, and then we define two important structures. The first one is the meta field type. We are not saying that they should be in the genesis state. We are saying that there are these types of meta fields are possible, like version number, schema, ticker, title, description, URL for the contract, max supply, dust limit, signature, whatever. And there are CL types. When we issuing a set, we have to have the following abilities. We need to owner own the assets. We need to inflate the supply. Sometimes, sometimes we don't need as an issuer. We may need to upgrade the protocol without reissuing the whole asset. Actually, this is now can be removed from the schema with all those tagging and the abilities that we added to the protocol. And we can also prune the history as an issuer, meaning that, for instance, I am Bitfinex issuing USD Tether. I'm defining some seal publicly in my genesis state and saying whenever 
anybody would like to prune the history of the proofs, they can transfer assets to me. Because of zero knowledge, it practically wouldn't expose anything to me about their history. But I can issue, reissue new assets. You're already trusting me as an issuer. And the fact that I did the reissuance will be showed, shown by that I will spend this transaction output. And I will define the next pruning output. So it's a different seal time comparing to the ownership seal. But it's not genesis, not genesis, because the idea of the asset remains the same. Because otherwise, wallets will need to add new ideas for each history pruning. So by that, we can, if we have a central issuer, we can reduce the size of our chain proofs from time to time. And they can aggregate dust transactions and do that stuff. So, but this is defined, like, it lists what are the possible fields and seals type. But now we need to make them interrelated. So we define which state transition types, it's the proof types, but actually now we name it state transition types are possible. And these state transition types are primary issue, secondary issue, I mean inflation of the supply, and asset transfer. And for each of the proof types, we declare which fields are allowed in the metadata and which seals may be uh, defined by this state transition. But additionally to that, we, we say that is it an optional, many, or just a single? So when we issue asset, we must define at least one ownership address. So who owns the initial issuance of the asset? We also may define the inflation seal. If we don't define it, it means that no further inflation is possible. We also may define upgrade seal, here it's not needed, and pruning, single seal. We always must define it because at some point we will need to prune the history. So now you see uh, it's not here, but basically when you have a pruning seal, you have a pruning state transfer type which also requires you to define the next pruning seal. So with the schema you can, again, it's like in covenants, you declare the rules how you can create the graph of the state transitions, with which properties of the state transitions. And uh, that's like we have a multiple asset owning, we can have a multiple asset ownership addresses, seals. And for each of that, when we do a state transition, when we transfer the asset, it must unseal only, only uh, other asset owning seals. So it can't un uh, unseal inflation seal, it can unseal only asset seal. I mean, sorry, close seal. <sighs> Not clear. Okay. There are different seal types. Like you can think that when we have a seal, defined, we just not define amount of the asset that is owned by the seal. But we also define a type of the seal. And the type defines what is the valid cases for the seal to be closed. So if this seal defines the ownership, we can close it only over the message containing uh, ownership transfer. We can't close it, we can't close it over the message during the secondary issuance or pruning, it would be invalid state transition. You will lose your state as a result of such an action. And these rules are defined by the schema. Moreover, we can say that when we do a state transfer, we may close multiple ownership seals. Or we may limit to just a single one. If you have a digital collectible, it will be just single. So. That's how, by applying a schema, we define the rules for this state transition graph to be valid, to remain valid, as an issuer. If this is broken, then the asset is destroyed. The state, yeah, the asset is destroyed, owned by the body that has broken the protocol. So we have a protocol how to do the state transition, and the schema is the protocol how the issuer can define a protocol and the rules for the asset, particular asset operating under the RGB. And using this structure, I'm not saying that it's just a human readable form. 
because we can do that, like we can create a standard for serializing it into a binary format, which can be read by the wallets. So they can validate the state history against the schema. And there is another example that when we do a state transfer, again, in human readable form, just YAML to show, we are saying that, uh, oh, it's asset issuance. We are saying that we issue it under this schema. It's a back string of the commitment to the schema binary serialization. Then uh, we say that it operates on the Bitcoin test network uh, by we commit to this state transfer by closing over this seal. We, uh, this is state transition of primary issuance. We define the name of the asset dust limit and we define that all the, uh, all the issued amount here is owned by this outpoint in Bitcoin blockchain. And then we also define inflation and pruning seal and uh, we define the original public key before the tweaking procedure. And then this is the actual state transition. It's, it is a genesis state from which a set is issued. Yeah. So anyone can define a new schema and then create an asset. A new asset type. Or new asset under new asset type. So schema defines type of the asset. So you can create multiple assets under the same type. Or you can create a specific type for your singular specific asset. I wonder if the asset is a node body. Uh, is it same as for the schema the stuff we applied to or something like are the assets from our initial Whatever. It's it's like uh, again, it's not the schema itself. Sure. It's something that can be read by the program and serialized into a commitment format, which, which is standard, and we commit to it. So uh, it's not a serialization format. It's just to write it somehow on the screen and just to show on the slide. So uh, I can write it in the XML, but it will be harder to read. I can write it in JSON. It will be still the valid thing, but again, you have more characters to read. It's visually the best form to Yes. Okay. But if I want to have digital collectible, okay. it wouldn't fit your goal. Okay. Yeah, you need to use a schema for digital. So you think a schema, is a, we had a concept of blueprints in the initial versions of RGB. It's a replacement for blueprints. And uh, it's a strong addition to the scripting language because once again, the protocols defines rules for all. The schema defines semantics for the asset type or state type. and the uh, script defines the validation rules, programmatical validation rules for internal state consistency. It's different level. And now the schema also defines where the script may be applied in the state transition hierarchy. So for example, ERC20 is the schema. ERC20, no direct, because ERC20 is a structure, a structure of smart contract. It's it's methods, it's a application binary interface into Ethereum network, so no parallel. But ERC20, like we need to define an amount, there is, should be a method for amount, and that's kind of, yeah, it's, it's kind of analogy of schema. No, we, we don't need a seal for simplicity. Simplicity is a scripting field. Yeah, yeah, okay. It's a part of just the state transfer. Yeah, oh yeah, that was one of idea. For instance, as a part of the schema, fortunately, we don't need to modify the RGB at all so for that. But you can uh, define a schema in which you say that there is a seal with which a uh, issuer can signal something to the whole community. Like, let's do an upgrade. Now we are not against upgrading to this protocol. So the point is that how we move with the RGB creation. First, we create a protocol level standards. 
And after that, we don't need to modify the protocol. We, do, we can do all we need with the schema. Like we need digital collectibles. We are not modifying standards of RGB. We're saying here the schema for digital collectibles in games. Here is the schema for shares. Here is the schema for bonds. I don't know. It's, it's also standards, but not, they are not at the level of LNPBP like industry-wide standards. It's just template. And then we can further elaborate on that when the introduction of simplicity, we can create under this schema a very complex reputational system and do nothing again on the level of protocols. They are defined once and forever. So that's why the most of the effort right now is spent on defining the protocols for RGB, not the schema. We just define that there is possible schema and it can do this and that. But we are not spending time on defining how to commit to it, to realize it in committable way for storage or something. We will move to it after the design of RGB. But the general, the last slide for today, uh, the client side validated uh, state validation process runs as follows. First of all, we ensure the correctness of the genesis state. How we do that? We trust the issuer. If we know that USD is issued by Bitfinex, we are going to Bitfinex. Bit site is asking genesis state for USDT. We're getting this state. And we check the state ID with what we received in our wallet. And we also, under this genesis state, we see the schema and we use the schema for further validation. Then, for each state transition in the history, right from this genesis state, we do the following. We check commitment validity on four levels. This multi-message commitment, transaction commitment, script commitment, and public key tweak. So we tweak, check the commitment structure of each state transition. Then, we check that the closed single use seals, uh, we check the closed single use seals validity and validity of the related straight transitions. So the graph structure. Then we check uh, that the single UCLs we define, if it is the own state, the last own state, are not yet closed. I mean, the transaction output are not yet spent. Because if we define new own state, we can attach them only to unspent transaction output. Then we check the validity of the new state according to its internal rooms, uh, rules, including simplicity and script. And then we check the validity of the state transition according to the schema, that it has correct inputs, correct outputs, types of state, metadata, and script constraints. And we do the same procedure for each state transition. So Bitcoin blockchain, actually, a commitment level, transaction level, schema level and script level from genesis state and we, what script what schema is defined by genesis state what script is defined by the schema and the state transition if it is allowed under the schema that's the overall structure of this client validated state so fortunately tomorrow we can finally apply all of this to working network Thank you. So I think we can finish on that end.